Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Elaine Ho, Vice Dean of Research, and I'm here to give simple opening remarks to keep it short and sweet. Uh, more importantly is to also, first of all, tell our participants, you have to stand at this spot, okay? <laughs> so that the Zoom camera can see you. You can't move around. You have to stand around here, okay? All right, so uh, hi to everyone on Zoom. Uh, glad you can join us. I saw a couple of familiar names. So today's event is on inequality, social inclusion, and the social compact. And we're very pleased to have with us four wonderful colleagues and speakers here who will be talking about better make sure I get this right, disability and work, gender parenthood and work, gender gaps in the labor market, and low income across national families. So this event is organized by the Singapore Research Nexus. A couple of our staff here have helped to put together the event, so we want to thank them for their help. Um, and the Singapore Research, Research Nexus, SRN, is a research initiative by the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at NUS. And SRN showcases research on Singapore uh, collating thousands of academic publications, uh, many of them which are available on the NUS Scholar Bank. It also has a collection of Singapore re related creative work, such as novels, poems, plays, short films, and poems about Singapore. So, we want to uh, invite you to go check out these resources and use it for your own research, teaching, and other creative works. Do also keep a lookout for SRN's frequent news updates on our website and Facebook. It also publishes, SRN also publishes books highlighting FASS research grants that focus on Singapore. And if you would like to know about some of the research projects that are ongoing, up and coming in Singapore, uh, about Singapore, please feel free to contact us at, here, okay, on nexus at nus.edu.sg. Okay, so very briefly, just to also give you a heads up about our forthcoming events. So we'll talk a little while so that you can have a look at the, um, uh, relevant links. So on 4th of May, one of our research clusters, the FASS Language and Linguistics uh, Cluster, will be organizing a seminar by Dr. Sean Standifer from the National Taiwan University. It's on making necessity relevant. Okay, um, you can register online. Um, this will be, uh, I think, a hybrid event. Okay, and then on the 17th to 19th of May, um, the FASS Research Division is supporting our uh, couple of our faculty members in organizing the New Technologies Research Academy. Okay, so this is basically um, an event that uh, showcases uh, kind of new and upcoming research on new technologies. Uh, it will be organized like as a masterclass uh, with some speakers, and it will also introduce to researchers who are interested in some of the new technologies um, that may be relevant to them for research purposes. Uh, first of September, we have a book launch at the Port National Library. This is uh, by our own Dr. Suresh Kumar Muthukumaran from the NUS Department of History. And uh, it's a book on the tropical turn about agricultural innovation in the ancient Middle East. And lastly, uh, on the 6th of October, uh, we have um, a similar research event like today, okay, but the theme of it is uh, on infrastructure and infrastructural thinking, kind of long at the moment. I promise you we'll work on shortening the title. <laughs> the environment and urban ecology and urban redevelopment policy implications. Okay, <laughs> okay. Registration starts in September, okay? And on this note, uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Yi Cheng Ong, who is Senior Lecturer at the NUS Department of Economics. Uh, her teaching areas include uh, the economics of inequality, labor economics, and microeconomics, and she explores ways to create opportunities for students to practice near and far transfer of learning. So thank you very much for contributing your time to help us share this. Over to you. <laughs> okay, so we uh, have four colleagues who have agreed to share a bit about their research with us. So I'll, I'll introduce them in turn, right, because by the time we get a four person, you'll have forgotten what I said about that person. Uh, so just briefly, uh, Dr. Renyi Hong from CNM, Sen Hu Wang from sociology, Jessica Pan from economics, and Taekyung Chu from social work, right? So first up is Dr. Renyi Hong. He's an assistant professor from the Department of Communications and New Media. He's interested in labor and its relationships with affect technology and capitalism. So the title of his talk today is Disability and Food Careers in Singapore. Thank you. So, um, while you're setting up, um, I want to say happy to see all of you. Thanks for those physically present for bringing the rain. 
um, to get to see the presentation. I'm also really happy to be hearing my colleagues of NFDSS speaking about a diverse kind of research, right? I think this should be done more often. Um, but basically my work around um, this, this question of disability and career work comes from first one main project, which I uh, looked with interviewing um, food delivery workers. So basically, these are disabled food delivery workers. Many of them have physical disabilities, but uh, not just physical disabilities, right? So I also have uh, mental, sensory, inter uh, 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 intelligence disabilities, right? But uh, most of them are physical disabilities. So they are using motorized scooters as well as uh, motorized wheelchairs to deliver food around Singapore. So much of my discussion will center on this group of workers, right? But um, it also draws for my larger research with um, platform work in general. So I've been working with NTUC as well as with um, colleagues um, in Singapore to sort of think about and work through the challenges of platform work, right? Um, so I want to start um, talking about um, this uh, subject by giving a bit of story. So um, last year, December 2021, um, Grab uh, went uh, uh, was publicly listed on the New York Stock Exchange, right? And it was a very major event, partly because Grab was uh, one of the biggest unicorns and still continues to be the biggest um, unicorn in Southeast Asia at the time, uh, at the time right? So it was valued, I think, at $40 billion at the moment that it was uh, it went public, right? And so there was a big fanfare around, uh, around this, right? So Grab um, has always had a very public-facing kind of uh, uh, kind of image, right, um, in the company. So they sort of got a lot of uh, what they call ordinary workers on stage with them, right, ordinary workers. And the idea, as Grab has always done, was to sort of motto was to empower people, right? So it sort of has this big point about giving economic empowerment. Now, um, this particular, if you see, uh, and this empower, particular idea of economic empowerment applies also to people with disabilities, right? So at the corner here, you will see a woman on a, um, on a wheelchair, right, a motorized wheelchair. She's um, Ross, right? And so Ross's image would then also appear on the billboard in New York, the NASDAQ billboard. Um, and, uh, it's sort of, and you will see the words uh, sort of portrayed below, um, her very first chance and a living came from delivering red food. And this is actually accurate. So Ross um, is, uh, has civil policy, right? Um, sort of a continental civil policy. And she has been struggling to get uh, employment for about, by then I think, 20 plus years, right? Um, and uh, Grab is really her chance at more of a, I would say it's not, it's definitely not full time, right? It's gig work, but it's a stable kind of appointment, at least stable to her, right? Because she has always been doing a lot of part time little piecemeal tasks before them, right? So, this, uh, at first glance, this is a great story of empowerment, right? Um, but we sort of see more complicated stories appear once we sort of look into the larger trajectory of things. So, what most people don't know is that months after this event, um, uh, Roz's uh, wheelchair broke down. Right, and Roz's wheelchair broke down, and so she went on social media to ask people for donations to either um, to subsidize or to buy a new motorized wheelchair. And this is not the first time as well that Roz had to do that. Um, and many of the people I spoke to who were also doing this kind of work with disabilities started off doing this on crutches uh, or on uh, manual wheelchairs, right? And it is only as they were doing it and that some member of the public sees them doing it that you know they offer to buy them a motorized wheelchair, a motorized scooter, right? So um, Roz basically did not have the money to buy a uh, motorized um, uh, wheelchair, right, to replace it. And so she had to uh, ask for money, money from the public. Now, again, this story is also not totally uh, complete, right? Because actually people with disabilities uh, in Singapore, they are given a uh, assistive technology fund, right? <coughs> yeah. And the assistive technology fund will actually give up to $40,000 for you to subsidize uh, your um, uh, so assistive technologies, including a motorized wheelchair. Uh, the challenge as if uh, when I've spoken to many people, these people as well, is that these technologies, um, to, to get this fund, you actually have to go through a social work. So some of these people do not go through, uh, do not want to go through a social work. <coughs> and also there's a lot of bureaucracy around this process. So some people just um, are not, you know, they don't want to go through that. 
for people like Ross, um, there's also a double challenge because they are uh, uh, congenital disabilities, right? So at a young age, they already had to use a variety of assistive technologies. So by the time they are 20, sometimes this, uh, the ATM fund is already wiped out, right? So 40K is already used. So stories upon stories, right? <laughs> um, is clearly revealed here is that the mapping of disability on food career work does not lend to either a simple story of empowerment or a simple story of exploitation, right? And what I hope to sort of do today is to kind of showcase the sort of layers that are sort of brought into this affair. Um, I'm not a policy scholar by training, right? Um, but my hope is that by beginning this conversation that we will start to think about disability as central to thinking about regulation or thinking about anything that really comes with food career work itself. Why this center disability with food career work? So the first thing I want to do is to, okay, so on the one hand, people with disabilities um, are, are indeed a minority of food career workers in Singapore, right? Um, but if you are, if you had any disability, um, it, and if you are not very highly educated, it is quite likely at this point of stage that a social worker will recommend you to do career work. Okay, the, the reason is that there is, uh, it's very hard for them to find work outside that space. Okay, and in full career work, uh, and I'll talk more about that later, there is actually a community of people who are doing this, right? Uh, and uh, they're, they're for different reasons, they really gravitate towards these jobs. Okay, so um, that there is that, okay? But also, food career work really sort of, uh, disability really sort of challenges the typical narrative of food career work, all right? So um, if you, so in 2019, right, when there was a lot of discussion about sustainability of, uh, of food delivery work in Singapore, okay? Um, see, the newspaper came up with um, this woman, um, Ghazali, right? And Ghazali, um, you know, and, and the Ghazali was very interesting because she sort of really flipped the narrative, right? So um, this was, this sort of video had over a million views, uh, thousands of comments. And if you look at the comments, right? They are largely praising Grab for giving her a chance at work, right? So that was sort of goes against a really the, the dominant discussion at the point of time, which was that, you know, food delivery work was sustainable, okay? So, so disability and food delivery, right? Uh, uh, always disability adds into food delivery, a, a particular kind of discussion that sort of breaks the mold of how we usually think about uh, food delivery, okay? And I think that that is worthwhile to think about. But also disability does not just apply to people with disabilities, okay? So with my own interviews with able um, delivery workers, food careers, right? Many times they are doing this because they are carers of people with disabilities, okay? So this could be um, a person with health issues, right? A special needs child, all right? Or someone, or another family member. Essentially, this is the kind of work that allows them to sort of run back to home at a moment's notice, like in a drop of hand, right? Uh, not unlike, say, working as a private hire um, vehicle driver where you have to pay rent, right? Um, so this one does not um, bind you to anything. So the kind of flexibility of food delivery work means that a lot of people who are carers, right, will gravitate towards this work because it really gives them the flexibility to administer sort of, um, you know, what the care that they need, right? The care that their family members need. But also, and I started moving along here, here um, the disability is also what a lot of scholars have called, uh, sorry, um, food delivery is also what a lot of scholars have called a situation of debility. In other words, the chances of you getting injured while you're doing food delivery work is very high, right? So a recent survey conducted by IPS of about 1,002 um, Singaporean delivery workers um, Riders found that 61% of them have been involved in an accident that required medical help, right? And the longer of hours you work, the more likely you'll get into an accident, okay? So by now, the, the sort of literature around uh, accidents and food delivery work is very robust, okay? There is, whether it is China, United States, Turkey, Vietnam, Korea, Australia, the literature basically comes to one conclusion. That is that food delivery work is very dangerous, right? And that it is likely to lead to accidents in some form, right? Question is just whether it is minor or major, right? 
Um, and in the United States, um, the uh, New York Department of Consumer and Worker Protection even described uh, food delivery work to be more dangerous than uh, construction work, right? Which has uh, historically been the most sort of dangerous kind of occupation. So it is with this context, right, that I am sort of saying that we have to put disability at the center of thinking about regulations around food delivery work, right? And food delivery work also must not be understood as similar to other kinds of gig work, right? So um, there is a particularity about it, especially its relation to disability that I think we always need to think about, right? When we are talking about such kinds of work. So my sort of main discussion today will center around uh, interviews with um, disabled food delivery workers, okay? Um, what I did in uh, about I think 20, uh, 20 and 2021 was that I interviewed 20 dis uh, delivery riders with disability, okay? Um, their disabilities are quite varied. So there are quite a number of them are physical, uh, physical disabilities, but then you have sensory disabilities as well, meaning that they're hard of hearing, they, can't, uh, they are somewhat blind, for instance, or they uh, have intellectual disabilities or mental disabilities, right? These disabilities can be both congenital and acquired, meaning that they are, some of them are born with. Ross, for instance, was born with cerebral palsy, right? But, but many of them are also acquired. So they get an accident, they have an amputation, or, um, they, or, they, or they, get, um, they get sick, right? And they're not able to walk any longer, right? Um, now, uh, common to my group of people I interviewed, right? So these are particular groups of people with disabilities, again, right? So um, disabilities here, these are workers that tend to be um, less educated, right? So they're not able to join in the job market, right? Um, you know, uh, especially with information type jobs easily, right? So less educated, and they end up doing um, this kind of work, right? And um, the common thing you see, though, is that they are this kind of work for them is characterized by low wages and perpetual insecurity. So about that is about two years ago when I talked to them, the average was about 800 to 1,200 per month. Okay, this is about a third of the income that an average food delivery worker receives, right, at a point of time. And also, they are, they, this kind of work for them is characterized by more insecurity. Uh, for instance, right, uh, if you're on a motorized scooter when it rains, you can't work. So during December, uh, essentially a lot of the times they can't go out to work, okay? Uh, as well, for instance, um, they, 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 many of them because of their existing illnesses, they can be sick for a period of time, right? And they will not be able to work. So this kind, the wages here are also inconsistent, right? More inconsistent than the average food delivery worker. Now, so um, I'm a critical scholar. Right, so I came into this thing, uh, you know, really prepared with the literature around exploitation for delivery work, right? And quite interestingly, though, the first thing that many of them told me was how much they love this job, right? They expressed a lot of gratefulness to the company. I focus on Grab here because a lot of them are okay. So um, Grab was the first or most stable source of income for many of the interviewees here. Right, so I talk about Ross and how Grab was the first source of income, right? But for many of these people, they previously were working as a um, data entry, right? So they are doing sort of piecemeal work, data entry, sorting at shelters and things like that. So really, Grab was the first chance that they had control over their work, okay? Now, um, now, what I also spoke to Sanil, right? Sanil is a sort of 50 year old, it's a 50 year old man, right? Uh, who is physically disabled. He has a blood disorder that makes him unable to walk uh, for long distances, right? Uh, and so he was previously a uh, security guard, right? And his wife, he told me that his wife was shocked when right? he told him that, don't call it that he likes working for Grab, right? Because he said that even when you're okay, I never hear you say you love the job, and now you're uh, telling me that you love your job. Right, but what Sanel sort of revealed to me was that how um, flexibility here really allowed him to work according to his own pace. Right now, flexibility is a very complicated term in um, in critical in sort of the area I work for right? critical scholarship. Right, because flexibility can also be a source of exploitation. Right, and flexibility is not always real. Right, it can be a facade. Right, to put you under some kind of algorithmic um, governance or some kind of coercion. Right, but for people with disabilities, flexibility is real in a very different way. Let's talk about another person, right? So another of my interviewees said, people have told him to work at 7-Eleven, but he says, look at me, do you think I can stand? So he can't stand for a long period of time. 
and he also has to change his catheter every couple of hours, right? This and to change catheter is not just you know change, go tell her and change, right? You have to actually do it under very sensory uh, conditions, so it takes a while to change a catheter. Is can you imagine a job that allows me to go to the toilet every few hours and stay in the toilet for about ten minutes, right? So this kind of work really, when you talk about flexibility here for the people with disabilities, flexibility does not mean quite the same thing to them as to us. Flexibility for them is something like, I feel sick today, I cannot, I can just stay at home. Or I delivered two, two orders and now I'm feeling giddy, I can go back to rest. That is what flexibility means, right? And for that reason, flexibility really is one of the main things that they say when they say that there's no other space for me to find a gear. okay? Now, for people especially with congenital disabilities, um, grab was also a space for them to find a sense of normalcy. Uh, interestingly, most of them told me that uh, through working grab, this is the first time they could inter uh, to interact with normal people. What happens is that they came from, um, you know, special, uh, special needs schools, right? And they were usually interacting with people with disabilities as well. And they are very shy to interact with so-called normal people. And grab really forced them out of the shell. Okay? And not only did it force them out of the shell, it got them traveling around Singapore. So for them, again, this is something that is uh, you know, very different from the lives that they are used to. And suddenly they are given this kind of this ability to sort of be integrated into the workforce. One uh, person with civil palsy told me that she was shocked that she was called an essential worker. Because, you know, like me, right? Can you imagine me being called a essential worker, right? Um, so the sort of logic around this work, right, uh, for people with disabilities really cannot be understood simply, right? And we have to see the sort of complexity about it. But at the same time, this, there is no real easy story of empowerment to be found in this particular situation. I give a story, um, let me talk about Irfan, right? So Irfan joined um, uh, Uber Eats in 2016. He's one of the earliest sort of, um, you know, people, people with disabilities to sort of get to doing this work. He started uh, with using crutches at first. Uh, and he told me that he could only do three deliveries a day at that point of time, right? Um, he later changed to a PMD, so this kind of electric scooter, right? And he said that uh, it was the heyday for him, right? He got $3,000 a month, okay? But PMDs got banned. Okay, and he later had to then use a motorized scooter. Now, Irvin's story is, you know, at one point it is a regulatory story, right? It's about how, you know, he sort of advanced using an electric scooter and then later sort of had to, was banned and therefore, you know, had to sort of use a, um, a motorized scooter. But um, there are other stories. There's, there's sort of an underlying until underneath his story, right? So one of the things was that because he was, uh, he's an amputee, right? So he is a single leg amputee, so he's using one leg, right? and he was using the PMD. Um, and as a result, what happened is that he overused that remaining leg on the PMD. Because as PMD, you have to be standing, right? Uh, and you have to also do balancing and stuff like that. Uh, and so at a point where I last spoke to him, uh, doctors were worried that he had amputated his other leg, right, because of overuse. In other words, um, injuries mm. around uh, such kinds of work are not clear cut. They are sometimes compounded, right? Sometimes intersecting with existing injuries and so forth. I, a lot of the people um, who I spoke to, many other people with disabilities I spoke to, actually got involved in accidents. Uh, and if you think about it logically, you can kind of understand why. Many people with disabilities work at night because they can't stand up. In other words, they can't regulate the heat as well as people who are standing up, right? So they have to be on their scooters, right? Uh, and so they work at night because it's cooler. Now, they are, they are in a very strange position because they are kind of like the lap of a child once they're sitting on the scooter, but they are faster, way faster than a child. So cars can't estimate them really well, especially at night where visibility is low. This means that they get into accidents far more easily, and also this means that they, they kind of fall off pavements and things like that. Um, and a lot of my, uh, many of my, actually, my response has actually had that. So what does this leave us with, right? We are thinking about such kinds of work. Um, I think that what, first thing we need to think about is that we have to think of work as really based around a lot of different layers, right? And um, sometimes they are not clear. There are always what I call screened injuries involved, right? 
let's just give a simple example here, right? I talk about Rosanna uh, Ross, right? And how she had to get loans to, you know, or, or get um, uh, compassion from social media in order to afford her own scooters. Some people actually end up um, buying scooters from Caruso, used scooters. Now, the challenge of buying used scooters from Caruso is that the scooter that you're using for food delivery needs to have a very different battery life from a typical scooter. So they end up actually, and these people are, 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 have, have very little move. So they actually end up with a scooter that they can't use for work, all right, and in debt. So again, these are not rare stories, right? And when they are stuck with scooters, they have to use it no matter what. So then they do these scooters and then their scooter breaks down in the middle of the road. Uh, and someone has to push them back, right? Or they have to sort of, if they can walk a little bit, they have to sort of push their vehicle back and forth. So these are some of the sort of small issues that you see once you, once you start thinking about disability and food delivery work, right? Another one that we always, uh, that I often hear about is uh, what I call Avery algorithm, right? So the uh, food delivery companies, right, deliver sort of uh, assigns you um, jobs based on distance, but not uh, location. So they can be asked to go to a space that really is inaccessible for disability, okay, or dangerous. Now, this means they must reject the job, which you do. But also then this means that they are not allowed to access any of the gamified tiers that most platforms have, which are the, are the ways in which you get more money, uh, the ways in which you actually sort of get better jobs. So in other words, then they are forced to be stuck with the lowest tiers of jobs, right? Um, now, so and it, as well, one of the last things that I, I want to talk about as well is the idea of protecting work. So after speaking about all their problems and things like that, you know, um, I kind of ask them, and especially people who have got through accidents as well. So I ask them like, okay, um, how do you feel about this kind of work? And they still tell me that they, they would love to do it and they can do it and they, you know, and, and they, they try to really downplay the kind of accidents that they have. Now, I think that this is something uh, important to think about, right? What, what conditions have we put in place such that people with disabilities are forced to downplay accidents to their own bodies in order to protect their chance at work. You know, uh, I think that that is something that we really have to think through. Um, and also then to suggest then the narrative of economic empowerment is something protected. It's something protected by the people who are themselves disabled because this is really their, one of the few ways in which they can get a job. Right, I'll get work. So the conclusion that I want to sort of uh, end up with is that there is really no simple story, okay? A lot of the present discourse around platforms seem to suggest a simple story, right? You have a platform, you have an app, you can work, you are empowered, you stop. It's really not that. It's a complicated story. And I don't want to make this story just about exploitation because it's also not really just about that. Now, so we have to think around this kind of complexity around these issues. And then also, again, to always relate back to the, to the important point as well that this kind of work is very dangerous for even able ones, right? And, and that, that kind of the getting injuries are very high. That's all I have for today. Thank you. Do you have any questions? So maybe I'll just ask a question of clarification. So you mentioned that um, we are, if you get about 40K subsidies, that's from the, which, which grant is it? For the enabling SG. Enabling SG. So enabling it's 40K right. lifetime. Lifetime. Yes, lifetime. Is there a rationale for that? Uh, remember, 40K? Yeah. Why is it? You have to ask for the SG. Uh, okay, and are there other, other sources of, um, you know, financial aid that they can apply for? Not for technology. No, in other words, not for the uh, scooter, right? I mean, you can get, I mean, Singapore's relationship to welfare is complicated, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, and, and so most of these people do not get much welfare, right? Um, so really, um, and for scooters, it can be very expensive. It is. And it's not just about the expense. It's about even just trying to figure out the space of electric scooters. You know, it's not, easy because for this for people with disabilities it's not just that i can use any scooter that comes my way they ask like, like this height only this you know this must turn this way they have all these requirements 
So it ends up that usually they have to also pay more eventually to get in scooter. So you know all these things come into picture. Are you sharing your findings with the relevant, I don't know, community groups that's helping people in these kind of situations, like handicapped society or with MSF? Right. So, I mean, this opportunity if you don't. Right, right. I mean, uh, I've, I've spoken to some groups, right, but um, not really a, a lot of them, right? I think a part of it is, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think because the, uh, the conclusion of this work is that this is not a simple story of exploitation, right, which is actually the dominant story, you know, like the un unsustainable food delivery work kind of story. These people want to protect their work too. So I, I guess for me, there is always this ambivalence about telling this story and how I should tell it, right? So here again, I keep emphasizing that there are these overlapping concerns, right? Because the last thing I want is that, uh, you know, a company like that would say, okay, like this, these people are disability causing too many problems, right? Uh, with the negative publicity. So like, let's just, you know, cut them out. Uh, but I would think that, you know, if you shared your findings with a community group that's interested and pathetic, then they could then work with the employers to find more, Empowering or sustainable ways forward. Of course, we don't want to deprive um, them of their job opportunities. But I mean, what what you had actually shared about you know using up forty k and then if your scooter breaks down, there's nothing else you can tap on. I think that that's really very sobering. Uh, in the longer term, it's about their economic empowerment as well. So I think you know there's really something here that's worth sharing with the relevant groups because they don't have the time to do the research themselves the way that you do. Maybe to build on that point, um, it might be interesting for your work to also get maybe some insights from the, the how they think about this. Not, 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 not to advocate or anything, but yeah, really yeah. just kind of maybe some simple statistics about what proportion of their workers are yeah. delivery work, uh, uh, are disabled workers. Uh, you know, this I thought the notion of the ableist um, mm -hmm. rhythms was a very interesting one that, you know, on some level I can imagine there may be no business case for doing something special for this group, but I could imagine that if it was publicized, it could become yeah. a business case. Mm -hmm. So I think just maybe thinking about how they think about clearly they're using this segment to also promote their own cause. Mm -hmm. So thinking about how they think about this group, are they making any provisions at all for this group? Or are they just thinking of them as another group of workers? You know, when it's when it looks good for me, I will publicize <laughs> the stories, or are they actively thinking about ways to support? Uh, that you could maybe marry together with your story. I think at least knowing the employer's perspective mm -hmm. might be interesting. Okay. So maybe speaking with some people yeah, there is definitely uh, useful, uh, just to supplement this. Yeah. Questions on Zoom? I've got to check the Zoom. It's like, no, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Someone from MSF on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us more about how you recruited um, those interviewees? That's an interesting story. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, I approached uh, social workers, right? That's the, one of the things I approached, people I approached. Um, but I also did, um, I, I myself, as well as my students, I got students, uh, I stationed them at MRTs. Okay. Um, and we, okay, with that, the problem is that you mostly get people with uh, physical disabilities because you can't really tell for other kinds of disabilities, right? So if you see when, when they, basically when you saw a scooter running by, they had to like really run to, because they, they are moving much faster than them, right? So they got to run and, and, and get these folks and, you know, um, engage with them. They could be speaking Hokkien, they could speak Chinese and English, whatever, right? So they had to engage with them and then get them, um, just tell them about a project and see if they are interested to participate. So that was, Basically, what I did, like the really down and dirty kind of step people from the street kind of uh, recruitment too. Can we share your research findings right now? Well, you're this. Um, so I'm I'm doing it at conferences, right? Okay. Uh, I I did speak uh, briefly at NGC as well. Um, but yeah, I think like what um, Elaine shared, I think that you know other groups might be interested. So I feel like, and it's gonna take some effort, but you could probably hire RAs to do this, right? Because you are really, you know, from what you're saying, you're using students to like chase down these people and have these like impromptu interviews, right? Um, you could start some sort of like a blog post okay. where you would have like snippets of these conversations, mm -hmm. right? And then, um, because it sounds like all the material is there, mm -hmm. right? So it's just a matter of curating and uploading. Mm -hmm. uh, you could use it as like classroom material. You could show how like students are involved in this research, right? Mm -hmm. And they just have like, I don't know whether even FASS would be interested in something like that, where they would, so, so first thing is to reach out to FASS to just 
like a community <laughs> guru yeah yeah like a feature <laughs> article story. and then on your own or on your department website or something like have this because i mean i, I think it, it is really great to sort of raise awareness right mm -hmm. wrong yeah so just thoughts okay, is there time for one more question so Rani, i just want to take a step back from the uh kind of the empirical story right and kind of knowing your work i wonder how you situate this in your wider scholarship Oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. So for me, um, for me, I I under, so I'm going to talk theoretically. I'm trying to think like how I can how I can make it simple, right? So for me, um, uh, I understand platforms as related to infrastructure, especially barrier-free infrastructure. So the interesting thing about the word um, platform is that it's literally um, access. You know, the, the train platform is a space for the access, uh, a train, for instance, right? So access and platforms are really related. We look at a history around uh, barrier-free planning in Singapore, a lot of which has this idea that if you could bring someone disabled from point A to point B, you have empower them. Essentially, if they can go to work, go to school, they are uh, empowered, right? And, and that, in some ways, is a source of rehabilitation. So my argument is partly that platforms have, and like, like, you know, Grab has taken on this in a very, um, I guess, a non-critical way, right? It's sort of, again, here, you have the app, connect, you get empowered, right? And uh, my sort of broader question then is with, so how do these imaginaries of technology, right? Um, you know, we, we have infrastructure discussion sometime uh, a couple of weeks later, right? But how did this infrastructural imaginaries then get mapped onto platform and then get mapped onto real lives, right? Uh, and what do they screen? What do they hide away? So part of my, again, as a critical scholar, it's always important for me to think about what, uh, what you call the biopolitics of that. In other words, what are the kinds of injury that come about through that process? Um, can I ask a question? So um, we know last November, there's an advisory committee set up for platform workers. Yeah. They submitted their recommendations to MOM. Uh, and then in, in that recommendation, they suggested uh, platform deli delivery platforms to look more into uh, workplace injuries, compensations. And uh, I think they submitted recommendations for to mandate that they need to compensate uh, delivery workers if they ever get injured or at work. Do you yes. think that changes the narrative that you are presenting here? Or do you think that even with regulatory oversight, um, people with disabilities will still be at the periphery? I, I think people with disabilities will always be, will still be at the periphery. So let's just put it there, right? Nonetheless, I mean, I can see where that, uh, why that regulation is important, um, especially just because so many people are getting hurt, right? Uh, when I spoke to able workers, essentially, right? Uh, average workers, um, they were just, like in a focus group, they will just have debates about, whether they could claim this, whether they claim that, how many days must you be sick to claim that? Like it is a it is a very nebulous process for many of them, right? So sort of really clarifying that process is just really important towards being able to claim workplace injury, right? Of course, the workplace injury itself has a lot of complications because how do you determine what is work? in a condition of work delivery. Is it when if you drive to somewhere to deliver food and you come back, are you working? Because you're going back, right? So there are all these things um, that, that, that are there too. Um, so so I, I, in other words, I guess my point is that I, I can see how this is important and I can see how this is useful, but we really have to see first of all, how much is it? What does it cover? Uh, and, and, and also really how people use it, right? Do, do, this can only be tested by use. Right. And I guess that would be my yeah. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Rooney. So we move on to the next uh, person. So it's uh, Dr. Senhu Wang, as an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology. He investigates the transformation of work family relationships and the consequences on social and health inequalities. And today he's going to share with us his research on how do managers perceive teleworkers in Singapore, the roles of gender, parenthood, and politics. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, 
Uh, hi, hello everyone. So um, my today's topic is about uh, teleworking and, and also specifically how employers, how managers uh, think about people uh, using teleworking arrangement. So uh, first I want to uh, clarify because there are many similar terms. For example, some people call it remote working, some people call it working from home or teleworking. Basically, uh, this work arrangement uh, is able to allow employees to have a more control uh, over the work locations, and it, especially uh, working from home. And people can use digital technologies such as you know mobile apps or uh, video conferencing to communicate with colleagues and complete their jobs. So. Uh, as you all know, that teleworking uh, is a very, very popular and important uh, work arrangement during the COVID-19. And in Singapore, yeah, so in, in Singapore during the COVID-19, about actually more, more than half of the employers and the managers provided these options. And also, uh, you know, uh, so uh, the innovative uh, flexible working arrangement, especially flexible schedules and teleworking is over to the traditional part-time uh, work arrangement as a more common flexible working arrangements uh, even after the COVID-19. So um, as you all know, actually in Singapore and also many other developed countries, and there has been a lot of discussion about whether or to what extent we should make flexible working as the new workplace norm, as the default in the uh, workplace. And I, I also have, I've also heard many uh, news articles and many discussions that you know in Singapore's more than half or even uh, more than seventy or eighty percent of employers they want to continue uh, with this uh, COVID nineteen flexible working ar arrangement. So then there is a very uh, important public demand for the flexible working. But on the other hand, um, I want to emphasize that one of the major obstacles towards normalization of flexible working arrangement is called uh, flexibility stigma. Uh, I was sad is that I've seen some news that, for example, more than half of employers, they want to continue flexible working in the COVID-19. But, but actually, I don't believe. Actually, I, I thought uh, the, the employer's attitudes and this is because uh, so the so there are some widely held beliefs that uh, workers use who use flexible working arrangement um, are regarded as less productive or less motivated and less commit uh, less committed. Yeah, so this is so uh, so this is a, a flexibility stigma. So so this kind of uh, belief flexibility stigma. Um, so. A major reason is actually the prevalence of ideal worker norm or overworker norm. Uh, basically, this social norm expects workers to prioritize work over anything else in their lives. And workers have to work very long hours. And also, it's very important, workers need to show up in office uh, in order to prove that they are highly motivated and highly committed and also very professional. So then uh, one of these the consequences of the ideal worker norm is that, you know, although managers, they tend to say that they support the government policy, uh, but in reality, the managers can decouple the government policy uh, from the practice. So, so there's a decoupling between policy and a practice, which uh, may create a lot of barriers for employees to actually use flexible working arrangement because employees who use flexible working arrangement are not worried about uh, losing pr a promotion opportunities and uh, suffering discriminations. Okay, so uh, yeah, so then flexibility stigma, especially from the employer side is uh, currently the biggest ob obstacle towards normalization of flexible working. Yeah. So, uh, Regarding previous research, uh, there are quite a lot of research, experiment, especially experimental studies, uh, focus on people's perception, people's attitudes towards flexible workers. Uh, but the majority of this research is from the general public's 
perspective, not from managers or employers' perspective. Mm -hmm. For example, in the survey, uh, the survey asked a normal respondent uh, about his or her attitudes towards flexible worker, but not from the manager's perspective. Uh, there are only very few uh, studies from the manager's perspective. Uh, they, uh, so the find is that managers' attitudes might be different depending on the employee's occupational status <clears throat> and also the purpose of using flexible working. Yeah. And, but there is still a huge research gap in this area. So, uh, so I, will, I will briefly explain my uh, research design. Yeah. So uh, my research uh, focused on the sample in Singapore, uh, joining from the uh, a sample uh, from the largest database in Singapore managed by the international survey company, Kantar. So, uh, so the sampling criteria is that so the um, uh, so the managers have to be aged between eighteen and fifty-five, and so the definition of manager is that they should in, uh, supervise at least one employee, and and also we also need to make sure that teleworking is is feasible uh, in in the in a manager's work department. Yeah, and also try to use some uh, weights uh, from the census in order to make the sample more representative uh, in terms of the managerial occupations in Singapore. So then the procedure is that each manager will read and evaluate randomly generated hypothetical vignettes uh, of uh, employee profiles. So uh, so then so then this is how the uh, how the Minutes or hypothetical employees uh, profiles are constructed. Yeah. So, uh, so I have several variables. The most important variable is kind of working status. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, an employee can work as a, a standard full time schedule at, at the company or uh, work a kind of working arrangement for two or three days. And also include gender and parent too. And also there are some context variables, and I will explain later about uh, why uh, it's important to have these variables. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So then um, crossing all these uh, experimental variables, then in, in total we have a uh, one hundred twenty-eight uh, unique uh, employee profiles, and and then this. Uh, 128 employee profiles will be randomly generated and randomly assigned to these managers, and each manager will be uh, assigned to evaluate six vignettes uh, in terms of the candidates' work commitment, productivity, team spirit, and promotion opportunities. And uh, then I use the statistical analysis uh, uh, random intercept melt level models. So uh, yeah, so um, then my main so uh, so there are three uh, important research objectives. So the first is 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 to explore whether there is a flexibility stigma against uh, teleworkers from the manager's perspective in Singapore. Uh, second, I want to explore how the flexibility stigma varies between different gender and parent groups. Uh, this question is uh, very important because we all know that in sociology and in labor market research, there are widely um, established um, gender and parenthood inequalities such as motherhood, wage penalty, fatherhood premium, and so on. Yeah, so they are already very, very widely established in sociology, but uh, very little is known about how this. Um, you know, this existing inequality uh, will intersect with future of work, uh, especially teleworking. Yeah. So, yeah, so then the second question is to explore. So the flexibility stigma, which is very likely to be a problem in the context of future of work, will intersect with uh, gender and parenthood status. So uh, the third objective is to explore how uh, flexibility stigma of different gender and parenthood groups varies within different uh, degrees of how working normalization. And uh, uh, so I will explain this objective now. So, uh, so, 
So then I will briefly talk about the motivation and also and and also my uh, and also the uh, and also the theory a uh, theoretical framework. Yeah, and why uh, why is the flexibility will lead to stigma? So this so the theory is called the status characteristic theory. So here, status characteristic basically uh, refers to some socially significant uh, personal attributes such as gender and race and social roles such as mothers or employees. Yeah. Uh, so these socially significant attributes are shaped or established by cultural norms and beliefs. So uh, these uh, status characteristics can actually differentiate people into different categories. Well, some categories being positive in the society, well, some of the uh, categories can be negative or can be stigmatized in the society. Uh, for example, hardworking, as I mentioned, yeah. So because it is against ideal work norm, and also motherhood is also uh, another uh, uh, deeply rooted uh, cultural stereotypes in the <laughs> mind. So this theory argues that this belief can actually shape people's expectation and people's evaluation about uh, future performance, which can finally, uh, which can ultimately translate it into certain behavior. Okay, so this is the guiding theoretical framework. So uh, another very important thing about the uh, status characteristics is that uh, one certain status character, uh, so, so the positive or negative status characteristics are not fixed, but it can be uh, can be different in different contexts. So, uh, so one, I'll give you one example is that, so I mentioned teleworking might be a negative uh, status characteristics, but if everyone uh, in the country, everyone in organization work from home, uh, then this then this negative characteristics might not be that pronounced and might not be that salient. But on the other hand, if in the organization, everyone working very long hours in office, you are the only one working from home, then this will make your uh, status characteristics very, very salient, different from other people. So that is why it's important to think about uh, the normalization of context. So on the one hand, yeah, so the normalization of teleworking may reduce the salience of certain negative uh, characteristics, or it can even change the cultural belief uh, about it. But on the other hand, we need to be careful uh, because if the normalization of teleworking only applies to certain groups, uh, there it is possible that it may increase the salience of certain um, uh, you know, widely held stereotypes. So uh, in this study, uh, so I will, I, I distinguish two types of normalization. So the first is uh, government policy. So the second is actual use of the policy in an organization. Both of, both of them are very important because I mentioned uh, employers uh, are able to decouple this policy from actual use. So then uh, for each normalization variable, I distinguish four uh, categories. And these four categories are all established according to the existing policy and also future expectations. Uh, so for example, it is possible that in some countries there, there is no guaranteed policy from the government. Uh, let's think about parental leave, for example, in maybe in the, in the United States, and there are no guaranteed policy. Uh, but in some countries, these policies only apply to mothers. For example, in China or in some other countries, only mothers can pick up parental leave. And in some other countries like Singapore, both parents uh, can take up these policies. Although mothers, as, uh, so mother's parental leave is still much longer. And, but in the future, this is uh, what we expect in the future, in the future of work, it is possible that maybe for most of the people and they, so there will be policy supports and they're able to take up all the policies. So as you can see, so there are different levels and 
group specific normalization. Okay, so then um, I will show the result. Uh, yeah, so the first result is that there is a significant uh, negative evaluations from employers um, against all kind of workers. But the degree of the flexibility stigma is, is stronger for non-mothers than mothers. So I, uh, I would just show some graphs. Yeah. So as you can see, yeah, so uh, here is no teleworking. Here is two or three days teleworking. As you can see, all these uh, slopes are very negative. They're all significant for all groups. Yeah. Uh, but, what I, but what we find is that in the non-teleworking uh, scenarios, uh, mother, the yellow line, is very different from other groups. So this is basically consistent with previous uh, evidence that there is a motherhood penalty. And the major difference is actually between mothers and non-mothers. Yeah. And uh, however, if there is uh, so teleworking, so if the employees uh, use teleworking, and there is a significant decline for all groups, uh, but the slope is a bit uh, uh, flatter, uh, although it's still significant for mothers. And so this is partly because a mother is, a, is already uh, very disadvantaged. And uh, so then the additional information, so the, so the additional teleworking information will have a declining marginal impact for, uh, for mothers who are already disadvantaged. Yeah, but uh, their effect is stronger, especially for non-mothers, especially for fathers. Okay, yeah, so this is the first result. Is there a typo? Is it 6.5, 7.5, 7.5, 8? The yep. y-axis. What if it's two 7.5s? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, no, yeah, so I think maybe it should be a 7.0, right? The second one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah so, there, so there are some la labeling typos. Sorry. You think you already say that's a gender gap and especially a motherhood penalty, right? Like yes, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So in the, in the non teleworking stages, there there is very clear uh, gender gap. Yeah, the motherhood penalty. Okay. Yeah. How about uh, like a single? Married uh, <laughs> women. Uh, uh, yeah. So I only distinguish. Uh, yeah. So. So the uh, so there's four groups. So the two gender groups and two parental groups. Yeah. So uh, only yeah. So so there are only four groups. Uh, so the second result is about how this flexible uh, flexibility stigma varies um, with different types of normalization. Yeah. So the second result is that for non-mother teleworker groups, and they tend to suffer significant flexibility stigma. And if they do not have the policy support, or if the policy support uh, is only uh, it's only applicable for other groups, uh, or very few people from their own groups use teleworking. And however, if there are policy support for these groups specifically, and and also or uh, most of their own groups use teleworking, so their teleworking uh, flexibility stigma will be reduced. So. So I will show example for uh, fathers. For example, um, if the title working policy, uh, so if the title working are mostly used only by mothers or uh, by no one, uh, so so as you can see, the slope is very very negative, and fathers are strongly penalized because title working is is basically not for you. Yeah. On, the, on the other hand, if uh, the teleworking policy is mostly used by parents or can be used by everyone, so as you can see, the slope, uh, so the negative effects uh, are reduced. Yeah, so uh, the similar pattern is for the teleworking policy. So if the policy is, is only designed for mothers or other groups, and fathers will be particularly uh, stigmatized. On the other hand, if the policy is, is applicable for everyone and or for parents, then the negative effect will be mitigated. Okay. So then the third result is that for mothers, title, uh, for mother title workers, and they suffer significant flexibility stigma, even if there is a policy to support mothers. 
and uh, their flexibility stigma can only be can only be mitigated if there is a very strong normalization for all groups. In other words, if the policy really emphasizes this policy only support mothers, and there will be even stronger uh, stigma. So as you can see, yeah. So uh, if the policy only support mothers, and so the flexibility stigma is even stronger uh, than no policy at all. Uh, so this is basically consistent with the status characteristic theory. So if the certain characteristics is made by the policy more pronounced, more salient, and this will not only this will not actually produce the stigma, but to some extent reinforce the existing uh, stereotypes. Okay, so, yeah. So then the key message is that uh, there is a very significant flexibility stigma for all tele workers in Singapore, and uh, in terms of policy, it is really important to delabel or decouple the policy from the specific gender and parenthood status um, during the normalization process. Um, okay, this is everything. Thank you. Uh, so thank, uh, thank you. Very interesting study. <clears throat> I have, a, I have a comments and then uh, a question. Uh, first of all, uh, to call this flexibility stigma, uh, it seems like it should be evidence-based. Namely, is it really true that flexibility uh, will give the equal chance for work with the similar productivity? Uh, so this is not different like so racism or sexism, you know, uh, Probably we can do some scientific research to prove there's this stigma is really scientific. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that's that's just my thought. I, I think that's my first question. My second question is your 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 theory for, for theoretical framework is extremely interesting for me. I'm just wondering that from the manager point of view, because the manager is also men and women with children, and those status could have sympathy. Yes, yes, yes. So if you can go further to match those views, probably you can go further to support that theory. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So I want to clarify for the first question yeah. uh, you mentioned, we need some evidence. I, I'm just saying whether it's a, why it is stigma. Yeah. It has to be wrong. It then is a stigma, right? So what if like really tiny work really reduced the productivity? So I, I think this uh, st stigma, uh, it is kind of the people's stereotype. Stereotype, yeah. yeah. So, but, uh, so in previous literature, it is called stigma. Stigma doesn't mean uh, there will be low productivity. Stigma just means uh, because they use teleworking, employers don't like it, and employer will have a more discrimination against employees. And <laughs> this will... Uh, you know, make employees worry about their work opportunities, even lose their jobs. Yeah, so this is. No, but I think Kyushi's point is, um, what if indeed, usually we use the word stigma when, it, so suppose that teleworking really and employers being completely rational. Yeah. You know, they know that when you're at home, you're just not very productive. And maybe they even correctly anticipate that across the different demographic characteristics, yeah. that indeed people will use the work from home time differently. Yeah. In which case, then it's not so much a stigma in that sense, but it could be a correct rationalization of what people are actually doing. I feel like in the vignettes, you could have done something like that. You could have said, like, you know, uh, I mean, without, I mean, you, you might want to say something like, you know, their, 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 their output, the amount of hours that they work is the same, whether mm -hmm. they're in the office or not, you know, to at least control for that. Um, you might want to kind of hold constant. I mean, you do see that they react differently to productivity um, in, in terms of perception. So the question is, are there real differences? In productivity between tele workers and not, yeah. employers may be internalized. Yeah, yeah. So this is a very interesting question. Yeah. So, uh, but for this, I only focus on employers. Right, I don't right. have the sample for the employees. Uh, but I, uh, I, I know that th there has been already some research uh, <laughs> looking at whether working from home leads to productivity increase or decrease. So, slightly different question. Did you ask the managers whether, um, like, what proportion of their uh, workers actually like work from home? 
Uh, yes. Okay, that's great. You might want to do some cuts because now I think the um, the policies that you look at are all hypothetical, right? Uh, within the vignettes. But you might want to see if the responses are different based on normalization that you're exposed to. Like that's already inherent variation in what you have. Uh, like compare managers who have a lot of work from home are already in their firms versus those that don't. Do you see these um, beliefs being different? Uh, yes. Across the two groups, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they are very interesting and very exciting future research directions, in, including the uh, you know looking at variation with the existing normalization and also taking account uh, managers' gender and parental status. Yeah, they're all very valuable. So just more of a suggestion, I guess, sort of relating with it. So you could include, for example, like because there are real places, right? Like Jamie Dimon, for example, has come out very vocally against um, flexible work arrangements. And I'm sure you can find like, you know, quotes or excerpts from what he said about what he believes is going on and why he wants people back in the office, yeah. right? To to sort of uh, illustrate this stigma. Yeah. So so I think it sounds like you already have the data, right, that Jessica mentioned. So it's going to be incorporated in this research. Like it's not future research. Right. It, yeah, it's like, it's like what, what's happening right now. Yeah. Because I what she's alluding to, I think, is um you're already assuming that all the managers are similar, right? <laughs> They're probably not. So so yeah, it'll be really interesting to see. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So there I think there would be many interesting uh heterogeneous uh effects between managers with different characteristics and the attitudes would be certain very different. Thank you. Uh, besides the characteristics of the manager themselves, I think uh, it's, uh, whether or not it is a stigma also depends on the nature or the industry of the companies of the businesses, right? And so, for example, now increasingly more startup companies, in order to lower costs, they find that actually uh, working from home, like tele uh, working, is quite viable and even like a better, a preferred option for many of the companies. And so. Uh, you, you do collect information at, at the yes, some yes. level, and I think those are very important um, moderators of the relationship between the VNAT and the uh, performance outcomes. Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah, this is also the very interesting future direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, I so uh, so the managers are from quite diverse industries. Um, of course, most of them from the service industry, but even though there are also a small portion of them from manufacturing or uh, some traditional industries, and this is very interesting. So, yeah, I, mean, I come from a different discipline. I don't do quantitative work, but um, because I do some history work on telecommuting. So it's interesting that each term, teleworking, telecommuting, remote work, actually has different connotations. And you think about what people immediately imagine when you say someone is teleworking, yeah. Yeah. has a very different connotation. So I mean, my own experience has been that, for instance, digital nomads refuse to call themselves teleworking, right? They are just say I'm remote working or I'm digital nomad, and um, they strategically use those terms to, you know, not get seen as traditional. So I think one of the things here is that teleworking is also often seen as a traditional kind of work. Therefore, the it, it's also very then the the logic here is that um, if it's a traditional kind of work, then it the in work at home is therefore it subsidizes something has a gift, right? So you can't interact as much with your colleagues and yeah. things like that. At the same time, then you have a totally different profile of use. For instance, for like I need to use Slack, Slack is more real than you know being in the office kind of thing, right? So then they are experienced with uh, and they will never use the word remote uh, teleworking. They will say they are working from home, for instance, or they are uh, remote working, right? Um, so I guess. Again, I, I mean, I'm from a different discipline, right? But I think those things can be, you know, passed on a little bit. If, 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 yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think this is also interesting, and it will be important to look at the meaning of these terms to, to different people and how it changes over time. I think that this is a very good point. Thank you. Thank you, Sun Hu. Okay, so now we have our Professor Jessica Pan from the Department of Economics. And she's interested in labor market issues with a particular focus on gender, education, and immigrate, immigration. And she's going to tell us today about what she has found in her multiple recent papers on children and the remaining gender gaps in the labor market. Um, thanks very much, Yi Ching. So um, I think my uh, presentation will have a little bit of a different structure from the previous two. 
uh, in that I will tend to cover a little bit more ground, but I think it's a little bit because it's based on some you know type of work um, that I have done, uh, but a bunch of work that I didn't do that others have done that I think sort of you know very nicely encapsulates uh, and actually relates very closely I think to uh, Senhu's presentation and also pro uh, probably uh, the, the the next presentation as well. And I think I want to talk uh, more broadly about children and, uh, and, and and its role in thinking about the remaining gender gaps in the labor market. So it's not going to be very Singapore specific, but I think there are a lot of lessons in here that could be very relevant for the Singapore audience as well. So, um, so I think just as some background to 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 this topic, you know, uh, as many of you are very well aware, you know, women have made substantial gains over the past few decades in many countries around the world, uh, Singapore included, and you know, women are on many dimensions more prepared for the labor market than ever. Right. So we have seen a very sort of dramatic reversal of the gender education gap, uh, including in Singapore, uh, as well as many um, developed countries and actually starting to be also in many developing countries as well. Uh, we know that women are substantially delaying childbirth and acquiring a lot more job experience. And, you know, if you, you, know, if you look at surveys about young women today, you know, many of them expect to work in their primary school. So um, this figure here shows you sort of this dramatic, um, you know, increase in uh, women's education relative to men. Um, over sort of a 30 year time period. So by comparing uh, two, you know, two cohorts um, spaced about 30 years apart, what you can see from this picture, which is from the OECD, so each dot um, represents a, an OECD country arrayed by their GDP per capita. It, um, on the y-axis is the gender difference in um, the uh, um, proportion of men and women with uh, tertiary education. What you can see is that, you know, in the older cohort of 55 to 64 year old, about half of the countries um, were in situations where men were more educated than women. Now, fast forward to today, you know, 25 to 34 year olds, young people across all OECD countries, every single country. You see this very dramatic in Singapore also. Okay, so we can take data from 2018, array them by age groups. I like to show this, uh, this, this, this figure to my undergraduates in the labor class, right? And what you can see here from the height of the bars is like, you know, two things, right? One is that you see this massive educational upgrading for everyone. But the other thing that's also very striking is that if you look at sort of, you know, Parents age group, almost 25 and above. In those cohorts, men were more educated. The blue bars are higher than the red bars. But look at today's younger cohort of 25 to 29 year olds, you know, recent college graduates. What you see here essentially is that you know women are more educated than men. So if you see more women hanging around the NUS campus, you know it's 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 difficult. <laughs> Okay, so again, this is like sort of the, the backdrop, right? So women have made a lot of progress, they are very prepared for the labor market, uh, education is also rising. And yet, you know, we are sort of at the point where, you know, we also look at the data and we realize that there are sort of substantial gaps that remain, right? So one thing that's quite concerning is that in a variety of countries, you actually observe what appears to be slowing convergence in labor market outcomes, both in terms of women's labor force participation and wages, okay? So, you know, women are making all this progress in free market investments, and yet, you know, not only are they not making gains, the gains are actually slowing, and in some cases, maybe even reversing. So uh, female labor force participation rates in the US literally hit a plateau and actually in more recent years have actually gone down. So, so that, that's, that's very striking. Um, at least in, you know, in Singapore and many other countries, significant gender pay gaps remain, even among full-time female workers. So this is not just a question of labor supply. And you know, women remain underrepresented even in high paid positions and several persons in fields. Now, you might say, okay, why should we care? I mean, in this audience, I think I don't really need to kind of motivate that. But I think, you know, um, equity considerations are obviously you know, on the list. But I think there are a set of efficiency considerations that, you know, are, you know, it's worthwhile to sort of spend a minute on. And I think this is the notion that, you know, um, that, that, you know, we could be leaving a lot on the table by not tapping into a certain group of workers like women. And in particular, if you think about the allocation of talent to jobs, and we start from the premise that men and women have you know, somewhat equal distributions of ability, and it must be the case that, you know, if you're an economy that's only tapping into a very limited pool to find its workers or its leaders, then, you know, you must be operating somewhere within the efficiency frontier. Right? There must be some gains to efficiency from solve. And this is, in general, I think the case of diversity, not just on, on the basis of gender. Uh, so there have been some papers that have actually showed this or more quantitatively that have, you know, sort of suggested that, have, you know, that there's a lot of potential for large macroeconomic gains from increasing uh, female labor force participation and wage convergence. And I think, you know, at least in this part of the world, when we think a lot about demographic challenges and, you know, uh, low, low birth rates, right? Uh, you know, certainly higher labor force, uh, uh, higher female labor force participation can certainly boost growth uh, by mitigating the impact of the shrinking. So this is really a paramount issue for us, I think. In, ter in terms of thinking about the barriers to, uh, 
to women entering the labor market. Um, you know, even in the corporate world, I think people are taking this very seriously. I think the empirical research here is a little bit weaker, and I think there's a lot of space to do interesting work. But, you know, many of the um, companies are making the case for diversity and inclusion really on the, on the basis, not just because of equity considerations, but because they actually think it's productivity enhancing. <laughs> now, so I think much of uh, this, this talk is going to be sort of centered a little bit around, you know, what is current academic thinking, at least within economics and you know, hopefully this characterizes also part of you know some of the other social sciences in terms of you know really what why is it that women are struggling to close the gap you know what are the puzzles and the challenges and then if we have a bit of time the remaining five minutes um, i have a little bit of a covid segment also so which i think uh, relates very well to what Sandhu uh, was talking about and uh, we'll see whether we get there so i think you know if, if i had to really sort of sit, sit back and sort of uh, academic thinking sort of two things or you know what are the sort of different explanations for the gender pay gap I think very broadly speaking, I kind of see them in sort of two, two fundamentally different explanations. Okay? The first set really is, and sometimes they get conflated, but let's just split them apart for now. Okay? The first is really about the, the notion that there, there are these essential differences between men. The essential in the sense that, you know, they could have different differences in preferences, right? Maybe differences in preferences over child rearing, differences in preferences over the types of work, uh, maybe differences in preferences in the types of engagement they want to do with someone, whether they want to negotiate, whether they're risk averse. Okay? They, could, they could really be differences in skills, perhaps, maybe differences in certain psychological traits. Um, and it's perhaps it's these essential differences that might drive educational choices and labor market outcomes. And then in this particular sort of, you know, uh, world, then gender inequality is really a manifestation of these differences. And as economists, actually, we are surprisingly okay with this. Okay, if really people were made different and they were cut different, and you know, they, they and, and they were different for those reasons, and these differences were essential. Okay, and I'll go a little bit into what I mean when I say these differences are essential. Then, in a way, you know, it's just what the world is like. You know? so maybe some of you might disagree. Okay, <laughs> but as an economist, I, I have not so much of a problem. Now, on the other hand, you know, there could be a sort of different set of explanations where you know men and women are mostly similar, relevant dimensions. Um, but, you know, they face different opportunity constraints. And these constraints could come in the form of well, norms. We heard quite a bit about, you know, the different types of norms that might exist, uh, maybe fueled by stereotypes, or it could be sort of, you know, discrimination. And in this case, then gender inequality in some way is a symptom of misallocation. And that's where, you know, we actually do think that addressing inequality can improve efficiency. And, that, you know, uh, uh, and that's, that's sort of, you know, part that, you know, as an economist, we sort of, you know, start getting very concerned. Okay. Now, there's a challenge though, right? So one, in a couple of slides, I'm going to show you some evidence, actually not from economists, but from social psychologists that, you know, can provide us with a little bit of insight on one. Is it really the case that men and women are really quite different in terms of essential attributes? Okay. I'll show you that in two, two, two slides. But before I do that, I want to tell you a bit about the challenge between these two sets of explanations here, right? And one challenge is that when we do actually observe gender differences in skills, traits, or preferences, this in itself could actually be endogenous, or it could be the outcomes itself of norms, stereotypes, and discrimination. So it makes the two actually really difficult to separate. And I think we need to be very careful there because sometimes when you know I present some work about gender inequality, people will say, but yeah, you know, but women choose that. <laughs> and really the question is, was it really a choice or was it impossible? I think there are other social scientists that appreciate this point much more than economists. So, you, you know, but, but you know, we, we often get that. It's, it's a choice. You know, we should respect their choices. But again, so, you know, it could be endogenous. So we have to bear that in mind. Um, absent direct testing, though, the problem also is that discrimination in, in itself is a residual. So what that means is that it's very hard to prove discrimination. Meaning to say that very often, sometimes when we look at, you know, two groups of people that look very similar and one group fares worse, we might say, oh, it must be discrimination. But in reality, though, at, at least uh, observationally, from the perspective of someone on the outside, it's very difficult for us to know really whether it's apples or apples. I think that's always a problem. And I think we, we had some questions in some about that, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and that's the issue is that discrimination is a residual, and therefore it's kind of a little bit difficult to sort of really pinpoint that discrimination is first order. Okay, not to say that discrimination is not important, but I think what I'm going to emphasize today is that. There has been a shift in thinking, I think, at least within the academic literature, towards experiences that do not necessarily rely on employers treating women unfairly. And I think it's important for us to confront these explanations because discrimination in some way is a very convenient thing and it could very well exist. But again, absent direct testing, we don't know that the magnitude. And what I want to argue today is that there are actually quantitative 
reasons why we expect that even when employers practice equal pay for equal work, that um, you would still expect to see gaps, okay? And, and, and that, that, like you do see in the literature. The other minor point I want to make, and I think this is something that I've been thinking about more, and that's the reason it's up here, is that really I think, you know, discrimination in some way may not be easy to separate from norms and stereotypes in any way, right? In, in some sense, you could imagine norms and stereotypes themselves as being micro foundations for discrimination. So the three are kind of working together uh, in impo imposing a set of constraints potentially. Okay. All right, so uh, before I get to children, which um, you know, I, was the title of the talk, Okay. Um, I, you know, um, I think it's useful to just sort of talk a little bit about, you know, whether men and women are truly different. Okay. So there are a lot of research papers out there that I think, you know, suggest that men and women are different on some field that I mentioned, which might contribute to differences in, in, you know, the kinds of jobs they might choose, the kinds of professions they might choose, and so on and so forth. But I think, you know, there's, there's been very interesting work from social psychologists um, you, looking at, you know, sort of very large-scale meta-analysis that really look at gender differences in a variety of domains. Domains that you might expect to see gender differences and domains that you may not expect to see gender differences. And I think what is overwhelming that comes out of this research is really that gender differences in means, differences across genders in terms of averages, are typically much, much smaller than gender differences within, uh, within a gender, right? And I think that in itself seems to suggest that, you know, our Im Im impetus is to focus on differences across gender in means, but really, if you look within a population of men or within a population of women, you get a lot more variation. So um, Hyde um, um, concludes um, um, in this meta-analysis that you know, she actually finds much more evidence in support of the gender similarity hypothesis than the gender dissimilarity hypothesis. And in fact, uh, there have been a variety of economics papers that have pretty good measures of behavioral traits and psychological attributes that many people think are different by gender. And what they find in general, at least in a regression framework that we control for these things, is that I mean they do matter maybe a little bit for job choice, but usually no more than about 15% you know, of the overall. So maybe they play some role, but it doesn't seem like it's overall. Now, so which comes to the role of children. And I think you know, for me, for a long time we know that you know children are obviously a very important part of one's life. And and you know, they bring about a lot of joy. But I think you know, in, in some way, if we think about um, um about gender gaps in the labor market, you really can't disentangle it from the story about children. And so, you know, children are key to understanding gaps, at least in develop, uh, developed countries. And I think what prompted sort of this shift away into thinking about really what is it that children do is that if you look at the data, and I'll show you a couple of data in a second, is that you will see this really amazing trend that really gender gaps for most groups really start to become very pronounced and prominent, really right at the arrival of the first child. Okay, so there's something about it going there. Okay, and we'll dig a bit deeper into that and to see what insects it could fall in there. So uh, what we find from this in general is that women will make career adjustments around childbirth and in anticipation of children, but men typically don't. Uh, women remain the dominant providers of household work and childcare even when they have careers. And I'll show you a couple of figures that really show that that's the case, which cannot be explained sort of from a very simple model of household specialization where women have typically had lower wages than men. Okay, so maybe in the past, actually, the way in which we structure work and family was very consistent, maybe even with the model of household specialization. We're not saying whether it's good or bad, it's just, it is what it is. But I think today that even that kind of a model cannot reconcile what we see, because even in cases where women are the primary earners or where they have careers, they are the ones that still take care of the children. Okay, so, so, um, so these are just some figures that show you uh, what we call child penalties around the world. So child penalties are essentially uh, what happens to earnings trajectories. Uh, you can put earnings on the y-axis, you can put the labor force participation on the y-axis, you can put work hours on the y-axis, you get the same picture actually across the board. On the x-axis are what we call event times. So event times are the years before and after the birth of a child. So zero indicates the year in which the child was born. So what you see here is that um, if you take out age and year effects, okay, so it's important. Here, it looks like men and women start exactly the same before uh, children. That's an artifact of the empirical strategy, meaning to say that they are actually a little bit different, but they are parallel. Okay, and they, they look exactly the same here because it's relative to the year of birth. Okay, so we take out age effects, we take out year effects, and then you plot this figure. I didn't do this, Clever did this, but we did this for the US also. You get the same picture. Um, and what you see essentially is that in the years before the child is born, the earnings trajectories of men and women are really very similar. They evolve in a you know, sort of strikingly parallel way. The minute the first child is born, uh, women basically experience this you know, dramatic reduction in uh, earnings. 
But more importantly, they, it actually doesn't usually recover. So even if you follow them up to about 10 years out, um, this earnings decline is still very uh, persistent. Now, on some level, you might say, well, that's terrible. Like, you know, at some point, doesn't it recover? But maybe on some level, it's also not so surprising because usually after the first kid, they have the second kid. This, you stop at two. Most people don't have three or four. But, you know, in some countries, they do. And so, you know, you could imagine that it takes, you know, quite a few years before you can ship the kids off to, like, college and then you have your life back. Not as natural. Okay. Now, so you see these um, figure, you know, that the qualitative patterns are very similar um, in the neighboring countries uh, and in English-speaking countries, but the levels are very different. Okay, so in uh, the English-speaking countries, typically like the US and the UK, the gaps are a lot larger than uh, in the Scandinavian countries. Uh, and if you go to look at German-speaking countries, um, the gaps are even larger. So um, you can also look at kind of how much this child-related inequality contributes to overall gender inequality over time. Okay? And what you see from this figure is that as women have converged more in terms of their educational and various other market outcomes relative to men, the role of background inequality has really shrunk, such that most of gender inequality that's left is actually driven mostly by these child penalties that you saw earlier. Um, this is a figure for Denmark, where there's very good data. This is a data, the data for the US where we replicated that pattern. And what you see in both countries is that child-related gender inequality accounts by at least 70%, if not more, of overall inequality at this moment. Brings us to a puzzle, right? So the puzzle is, you know, why is it that despite this converging economic roles of women and men that we started this discussion with, you know, women are still expected very much to be the main component of childcare within that. And there's sort of three sets of explanations uh, that I think you know could potentially resolve the puzzle, maybe more. And the first is I think we really cannot step away from the notion of gender norms and general attitudes. Um, there are two countervailing forces that I think may have made it even harder now uh, for women to kind of achieve parity amidst changes in the amount of more market work that's being expected of both genders, um, as well as the changing work environment. Yeah, so I'll just talk about each of these very briefly. Um, the first is gender norms. So I think, you know, um, in many ways, work family issues remain a, a woman's problem because of persistent gender norms. You know, on many dimensions, actually, you will see convergence in gender role attitudes. But what's actually quite interesting is that some of these attitudes are much quicker to converge. Others have become actually still very persistent. And there's been some suggestions that it might even have gotten worse, maybe because of our backlash, right? So there could be other gender norms that really only start biting when women's position actually improves to the point where it matters. So a norm like that could be something like a man should not earn, a man should earn more than his wife, which in the past was never relevant as a norm, <laughs> but today would actually become something that's quite relevant as potentially as a norm. So going back to the child penalty pictures and to show you potentially the role of norms. What we did was that you know you could break up these couples into different groups, right, based on earnings potential. You could have groups where the wife, the the the, the husband and the wife have the same education, so um, they have about similar earnings potential. You could have groups where the husband earn uh, is a lot more educated than the wife, more than two years, such that you know clearly the husband has higher earnings potential. Or you could have groups where the wife is more educated than the husband, such that the wife is likely to have a higher earnings potential. And what you might see, what you, what you might expect to see, even though you don't see it this bigger, which is the point, is that, you know, do the child earnings penalties actually differ by each of these different groups, right? So if it was really a story about household specialization, right, the one who earns the lower wage should be the one that takes care of the childcare, this is not the pattern we expect, right? Because there, what you expect is if, 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 if mom um, um, is more educated, then, you know, ideally, maybe her child penalty should be lower because it makes more sense for her to work, you know, instead of that, right? Or at least, you know, relatively speaking. But what you see again is this, you know, pattern that's strikingly similar. It doesn't matter which group you're in, the penalties look about equally large. And again, for men, it doesn't really matter which group you're in, you're just not affected, right? So that, that's likely to be something in the background beyond just sort of household specialization that's driving these patterns. Again, and we think here that it's likely to be not. In fact, if you look at the correlation between uh, the long-run child penalty in earnings over a, a, a set of countries with, you know, some sort of gender role attitude. What you notice is that countries that tend to be more conservative in terms of the way they answer these uh, gender role attitude questions are also the countries where the child penalties are higher. Okay, nothing causal, just correlational, but seems to suggest the role. 
I wonder what this will look like for East Asian or Asian countries. Yeah. So <laughs> actually, uh, I, I think there's more data now where they have tried to compute child penalties uh, for Asian countries. And I, my guess is that they will sit very comfortably on the line. <laughs> well, it's going to be like off the charts. Yeah, maybe off the charts, but it might skew the line yeah. even more. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, I wanted to talk very quickly about two countervailing forces, which I think actually might make attention even more challenging today. So one thing is, you know, we think about the amount of non-market work. You might have thought, okay, you know, with all of the kind of time-saving technologies that we have today, this should actually re really make our lives a lot easier, right? Maybe this should, you know, reduce the need to double shift, especially among the highly educated. Um, on the other hand, I think what we have observed in the data is that there has been literally, you know, sort of a, a huge growing amount of time that's now spent on parenting, which in, again, because of this sort of differential, uh, you know, uh, different, difference by gender, uh, typically imposes much greater demands on mother's time. Okay. Now you might, we might, you know, wonder why is it that's really this countervailing force? And I think that this is again where, um, you know, it is a huge open research question. There's a lot of speculation about why this might be the case. Maybe it's a cultural intensive parenting, could be rising inequality, and or possibly even a shift towards more traditional gender norms. But it's certainly clear that the fact that there is an increasing demand for non-market work really you know, kind of becomes more of a challenge for, for mom typically. Yeah, unless underlying gender norms change. So the other thing is that, you know, that was something that happened on the home front. On the work front, there seems to also have been some new developments that could, again, make this tension even more severe. Um, and in, in a way, I think uh, one thing that we've observed is that the returns for working long hours in the labor market, or you could also call this the sort of returns to inflexible work arrangement, has actually increased considerably over time, especially for higher educated workers. Um, in general, uh, we might expect that because women um, uh, uh, take on lower work hours, what this implies is that the gender pay gap tends to be large in occupations with higher returns to this inflexible work arrangement, right? And in a way, if you think about it, the fact that the labor market is becoming more greedy, jobs are becoming more greedy, actually tends to penalize equity within companies. So what does this mean? What this basically means is that, you know, if you have a man and a woman who both have a career, if the labor market typically or rewards sort of you know, good time commitment to the job, right? Long hours of work. It really makes sense for one person to specialize in that rather than two people adopting a more flexible schedule. Right? And the problem with this is that this external thing that's happening in the labor market would then tend to penalize equity within couples and make them you know, sort of forced to choose which one is the one that's good, you know, to, to, to go and reap the returns. And in general, what that would mean is that one person will have to slow down so that, you know, the, the two of them essentially can read the, the benefits from a fuller work company. So again, this is an external thing that, that could, 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 could penalize the situation. How am I doing, Jay? Good. Okay, so I think there are a couple of policy responses that people have proposed uh, to try to combat some of this. I wanted to just sort of briefly comment on a, a couple of them and to sort of um, you know, spend maybe a couple of minutes uh, talking about you know, changes in, uh, in the workplace structure. So one set of policy responses sort of uh, really revolve around work family amenities and really trying to augment them uh, to, you know, with the idea of trying to maybe improve uh, women's commitment to the labor market. So some of these uh, uh, include you know, work family considerations within the workplace, such as, you know, parental leave, part-time work, flexible work arrangements. Now, I think one of, uh, I think, you know, research has basically shown that some of these policies, you know, could attract and help to retain women in the workforce. But, Actually, they tend not to be very good policies if you're trying to reduce a gender pay gap. And it's, in general, the case because related to what Senhu was saying, as long as flexibility is negatively priced in the labor market, you know, sort of putting more emphasis on these characteristics in policies typically would tend to backfire on that. Okay? And there are some nice papers that actually show that, that that's often what's going on. Not to say that we shouldn't have those policies, but if the aim is to really narrow the gender pay gap, then these are not going to get you there. The aim is trying to encourage you know, children to have parents who spend more time with them. This is a good policy to have. If this policy, you know, if, 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 if the idea is to sort of you know, try to keep women at the same job, um, these policies might work. But at least for the gender pay gap headline number, these policies are unlikely to work. Now, there are another set of policies that in some way are a bit more convincing. And these are what I call the set of policies that involve how to a child. The literature generally shows that if you do subsidize childcare, high quality childcare, you do get increases in labor force participation and earnings um, among 
Anglo and middle skilled women. Um, this is actually in other countries because the kinds of subsidized childcare are being introduced by the EU. Now in Asia, it's actually quite different. We have a lot of market substitutes um, to, for uh, outsourcing childcare, right? Um, uh, foreign domestic helpers being the big, big one in Singapore, where a lot of middle class or you know, high skilled women actually use these services. There we also find evidence that they tend to improve outcomes in the labor market. And so people will say, well, then in that case, we really just need to kind of think of ways to subsidize childcare more. But, you know, if you take a step back and you think about what's the limit to this policy, my argument is that really, we can't achieve all that much with this, because if the idea was really to outsource all of childcare, then why bother having children at all? <laughs> I mean, the point of having children is to spend time with them, right? And, and so, you know, I feel like these policies on the margin will help some groups. We should help them. If we're thinking again of this policy to address the headline gap, then I would say maybe you're looking at the wrong. There must be some limited gains to this advice like, like policies. Which then brings us to, you know, sort of two other more interesting policies that I think in some way, uh, you know, are becoming sort of more um, common these days and maybe also more talked about that maybe mm. not thought. So one is a set of policies that really try to get at the core of what's holding women back, which is this notion of gender norms, unequal distribution of, uh, of labor within the household. And so these are policies that really try to target dads taking leave when kids are born. It's not an easy question because I think as Senhu alluded to, you could have legislation that allows it, but people just don't want to take it, okay, like we see in many countries. Um, on the other hand, I think for the you know, countries that have had you know, some good take up of these policies, what they do find is that fathers do take up these uh, uh, dedicated quotas, but usually not more than that so far. Uh, there are some persistent effects on fathers' involvement in child care and division of labor. Um, however, for now at least, the effects on women's labor market outcomes tend to be a bit badly muted. Okay. Now, on the other hand, I do think that these uh, policies are quite promising. I think we're still waiting for more good research. Actually, there's been a lot of very interesting research from Spain that has suggested that the introduction of a two-week paternity leave seems to have really shifted um, father's involvement in the household. In the short run, actually reduced fertility. Dads realize how difficult it is to raise children. But then when they survey children, if fathers were exposed to these policies, they actually find that children seem to hold more um, 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 progressive gender norms. So very interesting sort of, you know, um, uh, set of findings. So I think this is likely to become quite a big area moving forward. So Singapore also had a recent policy. And I think the last set of policies sort of focus a bit more on the demand side. Can we do things to change the structure of work, make it less greedy? And I think this is where, um, you know, COVID has really kind of led to this you know, interesting way in which we think about the organization of work in a way that we haven't thought about. So I know I'm running out of time. So just very quickly, because I think this relates very closely to what Senhu has, is that, you know, uh, I think even pre-pandemic, women had a, a, a pretty high willingness to pay for remote work and work hours flexibility. However, actually take up rates of flexible work arrangements were fairly low. You know, suggesting that it was probably an arrangement that was quite costly for employers to provide. Now, COVID-19 basically is, you know, in, in some sense, an economist's dream for studying the organization of work because it's this huge external shock, right, which was terrible for our well-being, but, you know, great for empirical studies um, because it was really a large-scale shock to the adoption of remote and flexible work technologies, right? It was completely just sort of, you know, unprecedented. Now, we think that on many dimensions that it's likely to persist um, because, you know, possibly because of investments in the infrastructure for remote work, um, as well as possible shifts in worker preferences for flexibility. Um, and in general, I think, you know, uh, related to the gender gap, you know, women could benefit from added flexibility in their jobs and their spouses' jobs, especially if it reduces the flexibility stigma that we talked about earlier, right? Um, so I think one policy question is, you know, how to support um, sort of more inclusive users of flexible arrangements. And I just wanted to show you a, a little bit of work that we did among workers in the U.S. where we ran several surveys that actually followed them over time to look at their preferences and expectations of remote work as the pandemic unfolds and currently looking out to the future. Okay, and what we see here, uh, we do this separately for men and women, and we ask them basically what their desired share of work from home hours are like in February 2020 during the peak of the pandemic. We ask them again in May. We ask them to assume uh, what it would be like if um, the pandemic was over and to assume what it was like if there was no COVID. So based, um, we also ask them you know, what their expected share of work from home hours would be like one year later and one year later assuming there's no COVID. We also asked them, you know, um, whether or not they uh, were reporting whether work from home was more important for their, their job choice as a result of the pandemic. Okay, so there are a lot of figures here, but the, the, the point here was that in general, uh, the pandemic seems to have 
really sort of increase people's preferences and expectations on remote work. And maybe more interestingly, it seems to have done it similarly by gender. Okay. We, did some, we did some additional cuts where we also looked at whether or not they had children. And we found that these expectations and preference shifts were similar by gender and by whether or not you had a dependent child. Okay. And we think this, you know, in some way bodes well for, um, uh, for, a, uh, for, for sort of an, a decline in the flexibility penalty because now there is sort of demand from all groups for, for this service. Uh, hopefully over time, employers themselves will adjust. But we think that these changes were likely driven in some way by the de de decrease in uh, actual and perceived cost of providing the amenity for pandemic. Because in the same survey, about 60% of respondents reported that firms themselves actually introduced policies with regard to inflexible arrangements because of COVID. And, because, and, and of this, about close to two thirds of it expected the change to continue. Okay. Um, so the fact that we see these um, you know, um, effects very similar across gender and presence of children really suggests sort of a more widespread take up of this um, of, of work from home, which in some sense you know, may actually change things on the demand side in ways that might be favorable to, to, to women. So again, you know, whether this translates eventually it remains to be seen, but we think that this is one of the more promising uh, things uh, are more recent. So just to very quickly conclude, um, I think work family trade-offs are likely to be first order explanations for continued gender disparities in the labor market. I think we really do need to look beyond supply side policies and encouraging women to just be in. Okay. Uh, we need to look you know, a lot at job redesign and policies that accelerate the weakening of traditional gender norms. And I think you know, in general, um, it's important to inclusive, what I call inclusive policy making. We should move away from policies that really just emphasize men versus women, who needs what more. And sort of, you know, thinking about this as work family trade-offs as that of a family issue, right? So something that you want to sort of optimize things within the family. So, okay. Questions? Yeah. Thank you for this uh, fascinating and uh, also a little bit depressing <laughs> presentation. Yeah, I teach a sociology of family, so I guess I will include several of the graphs showing today uh, in my lecture next time. And so basically, I, I um, a question or more like a comment uh, is that I'm curious about your thoughts about, uh, as you said, how uh, from the policymakers' perspectives, uh, like more inclusive uh, like policies and important in that, how we should turn from like women's issue to family issue. But, um, I'm like curious about your thoughts on the potential implications and to what extent, for example, when indeed more fathers uh, take up uh, paternity leave, for example, this motherhood penalty may turn into a parenthood penalty mm -hmm. and which uh, in turn will translate into this even lower fertility rates. Mm -hmm. And so that seemed to be like a, like a yeah. very vicious cycle. Yeah, so it's interesting. So, so I, you know, I think this notion of a, a parenthood penalty in general for both genders, actually for men, uh, if anything, now there's a par parenthood premium, as you know. Uh, typically, actually, um, uh, when, 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 when men have kids, I think what they find is, in fact, that they actually get a, a, a boost in the labor market. So, but, but I think that's a very good question. And I think, again, it's a question of what is driving, like, is it really that children are so incompatible to work, ultimately, that anyone has to bear a penalty at work? And if that's the case, then society has to decide, you know, do you want less children in a super productive workforce? But you know, eventually many years, you know, you will have a generation where you just cannot reap the benefits because you have nobody to left to, 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 to benefit from it. Or do you ultimately want a situation where you know, uh, the work, work is really compatible with family? So I think you raise a very interesting point. And I think in some way, uh, it is sort of, there, there are certain sets of policies with, which necessarily have a trade-off. Um, but there are also a set of policies we, which may not. So I think even in the case of paternity leave, for example, part of the reason why I think that there is this penalty is, again, a relative comparison between men and women. Maybe, you know, in terms of the, some terminology, you know, because of ideal work on it. It becomes normalized and everybody does that. And, you know, those are the kinds of things that workers demand. Employers will have to adjust because they are faced with, you know, basically their work. So I don't think it's necessarily the case. I, I think it's sort of even more doomsday scenario if it ends up being a, a parent thing in that sense. But, but I think it's worth thinking about. I never really thought about it that way. I think nowadays there's already increasing division between men parents uh, with his parents. And so like the younger generations in particular thinking uh, fertility, low fertility or manage their business. And so they don't need to really care about uh, 
like the well-being and performance of, uh, of the populations of parents. And so from, uh, especially when uh, that trend like um, uh, proceeds, right? And so low fertility and so the low intention and the desire of fertility continues. And so in the long run, it translates into from the perspective of the employers, definitely um, like profits, like they're like biggest concern, right? And so when there's the resident population of non parents, so definitely from their calculations. This, uh, yeah, no, uh, no, absolutely. And I think again, this is back to, you know, it, uh, you know, we had a slide a little bit of why is it that non market time uh, requirement to be a good parent has become so much, right? In the past, people had a lot of children and they probably spent, um, you know, less time on each child, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think today that's really the sense that, you know, if you do have a child, you have this responsibility, you need to spend this amount of time. And maybe, again, this is back to a societal backdrop where there is rising inequality, there is competition, maybe perceived or actual. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that, you know, if it really does come down to that of a parenthood penalty, then society needs to relook at the way it's... Uh, it's, it's, you know, sorting people and, and, and creating incentives for the next generation in order to fix that problem. So, I mean, sort of off the record, like, I, I think that for us, you know, one way to potentially solve our fertility problem is to remove the PSLE, right? I mean, there, there, there are a lot of inbuilt systems of sorting and screening within our education system that does make you ask yourself, is it necessary? I mean, people will be sorted in life anyway. Right, they have to, right? I mean, employers sort, do we need to sort them so early and create all these incentives for a rat race? Maybe that those are the sets of policies that will then kind of address fertility. But yeah, thank, thank you for the question. Thoughts on uh, egg freezing as uh, you know, more and more and more companies are offering this as a benefit for their female employees and how does that benefit parents? How does that affect? Yeah, I know that's a really big question. Actually, it's interesting because Singapore only recently allowed egg freezing, but only for women above 35, I think. Um, I mean, certainly I think, you know, women should be given the choice. I mean, uh, how exactly it plays into all of this is actually quite tricky, I think, because I think, um, I'm not sure if there's clear research on this, but the fact that you offer women the opportunity to egg freeze and the likelihood of um, delay, I think you'll find that there will be many groups of women who will do that, right? particularly the ones who are very career-oriented. On the other hand, as many of you may be well aware from the medical literature, it doesn't just mean that if your egg is frozen that you can you know, actually have the child. And it turns out that actually um, there is still a very steep age gradient right, with that. And so there could still be a, a, a very dicey situation where women invest in their careers, you know, status quo, nothing else changed, with the expectation that they can then use their option value, which then doesn't actually materialize or becomes really quite hard. So I think there's a lot of research interesting research in that space that can be done to understand about, you know, beliefs and expectations. Um, but I think certainly, you know, with, uh, I mean, when contraceptive, contraceptive pills were introduced, actually, it's been credited for actually women being able to sort of enter uh, careers and professions and uh, undertake human capital investments. I think egg freezing has a similar kind of thing on a different market. But um, I, I think, yeah, we, we, we still don't know a lot. Hey, Jessica, thank you so much. Uh, I have a question. Uh, as a sociologist, we perceive gender inequality within the social inequality. I think it's a part of the social inequality. Uh, uh, my general question is, uh, uh, effort of promoting gender equi equity necessarily translate to better outcome of social inequality. I'm saying this because recently, uh, some study in East Asia find out uh, Having uh, uh, getting married or having a baby is actually very middle class thing. Very, uh, I, I mean, actually poor family and lower strata refuse to follow the demographic trend at all. In that sense, uh, we, our effort focus on those middle class family really makes sense. But on the other side, uh, you see those people may not even choose to have a baby. So, so how economics will incorporate this uh, into the analysis framework? That's my question. Well, so that's a very big question. And I think yeah. we, know, we can debate this, but I, I am not entirely convinced that um, people cannot be incentivized to have children if the conditions are right. I give you an example. Mm -hmm. here. I don't know about that. So 
you know the well-known fertility um, uh, decline in uh, East Asia, right? Mm. It's it's very unique to East Asia and Southern mm. Europe. Actually, uh, the, the, the the Scandinavians are having children. Actually, mm. the Americans are also having children. Yeah, yeah. There are a lot of groups of people having children. Mm. And typically, if we plot the same picture, mm. fertility rates are better um, for given uh, de developmental... I mean, of course, you cannot lump everyone together, but if you control for GDP per capita, typically the ones with more uh, progressive gender norms are also the countries with higher fertility. They also have higher rates... Um, of uh, educated women getting married uh, uh, re relative to uh, less educated women. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a very interesting interplay still, mm -hmm. with, which is within the economics realm between uh, economic advancement, women's labor for market opportunities, and gender norms. And I think until I'm fully convinced that margin is no longer at play, mm -hmm. I still think we are still within the realm of like uh, of, of, of you know gender norms constraining uh, some women's decision, making it very costly to balance both, and that's what people are opting out. So, so but, but, but let's have a chat. I mean, I think that's sure. very interesting. Sure. Mm -hmm. So our comments actually have a paper on that about why East Asian countries tend to have um, more married people tend to have children, but they tend to have like one or two children. It's because of this, uh, the fact that females are still expected to show the, the caregiving and household burden. Mm -hmm. Did you do it in a... Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. There's a question from the chat. So I, I think broadly speaking, I think in terms of methodological approaches, I, um, I mean, I, I think what I presented was quite general, but I think each of um, those, um, you know, where possible, were kind of backed up by um, by studies that have tried to use the longitudinal data of uh, various sort of methodological approaches to try to study. I think there's still a lot of work being done on trying to evaluate public policy. Some of it is very new, right? The problem with paternity leave is that in many countries, they were only very recently um, adopted. You might actually think that for it to really work through the mechanism of social norms, it does take time also. So just also focusing on a given point in time may not necessarily really reveal its effectiveness. You might have to wait you know, some, some amount of time before you see it. But I think uh, it, it's a great question. I think quite general. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, great. So we're almost, we're on to our last presentation. So Associate Professor He Kyung Chu from the Department of Social Work. So she has two key research areas. The first concerns children and adolescents' health and behaviors and risky online behaviors. The second is on children from socially vulnerable families. So I think that's what she's focusing on today. The title of her presentation is Social Capital and Integration of Cross-National Families with Low Income. Rules of the family for foreign spouses integration. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction, Nichen. Okay, uh, the topic of my presentation, yeah, is about cross national families with low income in Singapore. And uh, um, I'm looking at their integration part, yeah, and then the, what's the role of the families for, uh, particularly the foreign spouses of these families in integration. So, um, uh, as you uh, already know, uh, as you already know, uh, yeah, in Singapore, um, about like a twenty-four percent of marriages in uh, twenty nineteen, even now, uh, involve international couples, with the vast majority, about like a seventy-two percent of these couples being Singaporean men and uh, foreign women. Um, uh, that pattern has been rather, you know, the stable in the past decade. I do say sometimes it's. I mean, goes up to even like a thirty percent or something. But anyway, uh, this I mean, the cross-national families, you know, formed by international marriages, is not really like a homogeneous group. So among the uh, subgroups of this population by you know social economic status, the low-income cross-national families are typically formed by you know marriage between working-class Singaporean men and non-citizen women from uh, Southeast Asia or mainland China these days. Okay, so the if you look at the um uh, you know the, the, these families, I mean uh, sometimes we call these families, I mean the transnational families in Singapore, yeah. Mm, and then I sometimes call these families binational families. By the way, I mean I mean to clarify, you know, what kind of term we are using here. But in this presentation, I'm going to use cross-national families here. Yeah. 
But anyway, so if you look at these families, the focus is usually um, uh, the, the placed on um, the foreign spouses, yes, because of their so psychosocial vulnerabilities. Uh, the typically we look at um, like their acculturation stress and the mental health issues. Uh, otherwise, yeah, we tend to look at their, you know, uh, the, the experience of like a being victimized by like a family violence and etc. So these are the main for CA of, I mean, uh, the research uh, on this topic, I mean, the, the, the families, I mean, the, the focusing on the foreign spouses and their like a psychosocial vulnerabilities. But however, um, we don't quite understand, I mean, these foreign spouses, I mean, social integration from their own perspective. So uh, what actually makes them feel integrated in the host, I mean, into the, uh, the host society mm -hmm. yeah, in Singapore in particular? So uh, that's the question um, we had when we studied this paper. So um, if you uh, look at like a social integration literature on like a migrants in general, then usually the, I mean, the historically they're integrated, I mean, the migrants integration has been understood through like a cultural lens in particular, right? Like a cultural, when we talk about like integration, that means you know, cultural integration or like assimilation. Uh, so for example, like in South Korea, yeah, um, the integration uh, usually uh, conceptualized as like a assimilation to uh, the host country, yeah. Or um, a very well-known uh, social psychologist, yeah, John Barry, a Canadian researcher, um, actually has uh, has proposed, I mean, the disintegration, cultural integration model for many, many years already. Yeah. So, uh, the, so uh, the migrants are like, you know, uh, culturally very competent in uh, the both areas, meaning like, uh, you know, uh, the culture of their own uh, country of origin, as well as the culture of their own, you know, the host country. So you are, you are very like a, a culturally competent in both cultures, then you consider as, you know, like a uh, integrated. So for example, uh, okay, I'm from Korea, but uh, I'm, you know, uh, I'm in very good contact uh, in uh, contact in with my, you know, the Korean, uh, the, the members, I mean, the Korean people in Singapore, but uh, also I have very, you know, good big circle of, I mean, the Singaporean friends here. So I'm also eating uh, Singaporean food very well, as well as Korean food. Then, yeah, you tend to be seen, you know, as a, like a, a well integrated. But then the, you can see, I mean, the integration is not just so here, but like a cultural integration, right? I mean, the, there are many dimensions. I mean, the domains you can, uh, you need to be integrated. I mean, as a migrant, I mean, to, uh, to settle down, you know, for, uh, in the host country. So uh, particularly in the past decade, I mean, extended frameworks for migrant integration has been, I mean, have been suggested. So um, the, one of the examples is by Spencer and Charlie's in uh, like 2016. So um, according to uh, these researchers, the integration is a process with no end state. It's not like, okay, I'm fully integrated. Not like that. I mean, who knows? I mean, I feel like, okay, I'm very integrated until last year, but then the, you know, in the next five years or 10 years, okay. I feel like, oh, okay, uh, this is not what I, uh, you know, think about, you know, the integration. I mean, what I thought about integration, maybe yeah. I, now I see, you know, some kind of like ceilings, you know, my career path or something, maybe, yeah, I don't think I'm that integrated, something like that, right? And also, uh, you know, there, there is a, like a bi-directional or multi-directional process between uh, my individual migrants and then the society, of course, yes. So, um, and then it involves, of course, yes, spatial and temporal characters around, you know, the, the integration process, of course. But then the, what I would like to highlight is that, you know, the multi-domains, I mean, the, the integration is taking in the multi-domains of individual life and the society. Uh, multi-domain as in, I mean, the, you know, the structural domains and then the social domains and cultural domains and civic and political domains and identity domains in, yeah. Uh, in, yeah. So um, these multiple domains actually all interrelated, as you can, you know, imagine easily, right? Mm. So, um, according to uh, Spencer and Charlie, uh, Charles Lee, uh, yeah, they actually, ex I mean, the, <laughs> actually draw these kind of like a figures to show, I mean, the, how these are all interrelated, yeah, uh, affect each other. I mean, the, the integration in different domains, you know, uh, affect each other. And then the, what are some uh, the effectors uh, within each domains, I mean, uh, to the outcome of integration in within each domain, as, as well as, I mean, the cross domains, yeah. So you can see very, very complex, I mean, the complex, but uh, the, the making sense, you know, I mean, sense making uh, the, the diagrams, I mean, the figures here, 
um, when you think of like in integration, migrants integration in um, the different uh, the life domains, I mean, the societal domains like that. But then the thing is, I mean, um, the, there might be some kind of like a structural, I mean, the, the relationships between, I mean, the, these domains possible, right? So for example, like if you think of like, you know, identity as a one integration domain. So identity as in, you know, sense of belonging to the host country. So then uh, maybe that comes uh, uh, in the end, I mean, as a result of integration in, like uh, maybe the in social relationship, cultural relationship, and et cetera, et cetera, right? I mean, that could be one hypothesis you can have. So um, the building on this kind of, you know, um, uh, the conceptual framework, I mean, the multi-domain uh, conceptual framework for integration of migrants. Um, the, the Chang uh, in 2017 actually uh, proposed a two-step social integration model for managed migrants. So the thing is, I mean, you know, uh, the marital family first and the host society second. That means, I mean, integration should happen within the family. I mean, the, uh, the marital family of the marriage mi uh, migrant first. And yeah, the marriage migrant can be uh, integrated into uh, the host society. So uh, in, uh, so that's what uh, the Chang tried to argue uh, argue for. Uh, argue for. And so that means, I mean, the she, I mean, the in her like a qualitative study, I mean, she looked at actually the the the, the uh, how you know the support from the local spouses and the local family laws actually help the uh, marriage migrants to uh, learn uh, the language of the host country and then the uh, the finding uh, find out you know the, the resources available in the community and then um, yeah uh, access to I mean the uh, Education system and etc. So that the the marriage migrant, uh, you know, of the I mean, of the families actually uh, can uh, integrate into the uh, host the society. So that's the simple. I mean, that this is right, uh, rather simple idea. But then the, it uh, makes actually very good sense. I mean, when you try to understand, you know, uh, the integration of marriage migrants. So, um, but the, uh, some limitation uh, of uh, the, this proposal based on this, uh, the small scale, not that small scale, but anyway, this qualitative study um, is uh, includes, I mean, it has some limitations. So uh, one uh, is actually, uh, it doesn't really uh, look at a, I mean, the examine the, a full range of integration domains, uh, nor, I mean, the, the relative importance among, you know, the different domains I mean, of uh, integration. Uh, yeah, uh, that's one, uh, I mean, uh, that's one limitation of this study. And also uh, the study looked at only the Vietnamese foreign spouses living in Taiwan and South Korea. Uh, so the, the, you know, the generality of uh, the findings can be quite limited. Uh, another thing is, I mean, the, uh, you know, another limitation of this uh, study is that uh, social, con I mean, integration um, in the study uh, in this study context actually concerns mainly access to the institutional programs and community resources, which is rather like a proxy measure of integration. I would say accessing something doesn't necessarily mean, I mean, uh, you know, you are integrated. You have opportunity to integrate it. I mean, integrate into the society, but it's not really, you know, uh, integration itself. So I, I thought, I mean, there should be some direct measures of integration, for example, like a sense of belonging to the, uh, the host society, maybe. So, um, so I'll try to, I mean, the look at, I mean, uh, uh, so that's why I think, I mean, the um, among many, uh, you know, I mean, the, among the integration in the many different domains, I thought uh, the sense of belonging uh, might be uh, the, rather like ultimate kind of integration outcomes for many, I mean, the, for, uh, the migrants. So um, uh, the, the focus uh, uh, now, I, yeah, in, in this paper, yeah, we focus on the sense of belonging. So the sense of belonging, I mean, the migrants develop sense of belonging to the host society when they feel secure and then accepted uh, in their adapted country, of course. Uh, but the, this one, I mean, the sense of belonging actually forms a part of the core uh, of one's identity for sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that uh, actually resonates, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, integration domain of identity proposed by uh, Spencer and Charles. I mean, uh, Charles Lee's integration, uh, the model. Uh, uh, in addition to that, I mean, the, the, the empirical studies actually um, 
revealed that uh, the sense of belonging is quite predictive of you know the life satisfaction and then also the mental health outcomes among migrants. And then so uh, it's quite worthwhile. I mean the examining um, the I mean the sense of belonging as uh, integration outcomes. And uh, uh, also um, the social capital, uh, in, I mean, uh, including like a bonding social capital, creating social capital, but particularly the, the, uh, the, the form of social capital as in, you know, the family support has been uh, found to be as a determinant of a uh, sense of belonging among migrants. So uh, based on, I mean, the, the, the review of uh, the literature on this, um, actually, yeah, I reconceptualized, I mean, Spencer and Charles List, I mean, um, the model for integration of, you know, the migra marriage migrant. So of course, I mean, you know, you, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the other domains uh, should all uh, relate, I mean, the correlated, although in my, I mean, the statistical analysis, I didn't allow, you know, the, these correlations in my model because mine is quite simple. But the, my point is, I mean, the, uh, you know, the integration in these uh, domains, okay, structural domains and social domains, cultural domains and civic and political domains and integration in family domains uh, would be predictive of, I mean, the ultimate, uh, the in integration outcome as in, you know, identity. In other words, I mean, the sense of belonging. Um, so uh, that's the conceptual framework I actually uh, used by adapting from uh, Spencer and Charles List integration model for yeah, managed migrants. But by the way, I just want to highlight, you know, I actually uh, use another like, a, I, I mean, the integration, I mean, identity domain integration measure, which is, I mean, acceptance of the society, meaning, uh, um, you, know, you must, uh, I mean, the, for you to be integrated, uh, for you to integrate in the, into the host society, you must see your, uh, your host society is acceptable, right? I mean, the culturally and then, you know, socially. So uh, yeah, yeah, this is acceptable society for me, to my moral standard or to my values and my worldviews and et cetera, right? Yeah, so that's why I uh, included this one as a kind of like another measure of like identity integration uh, outcome. Okay, so uh, the, uh, the study aim um, is that, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, study aims are twofold. Uh, with a focus on the family domain integration, uh, we looked at, I mean, we, we try to actually determine the independent effect of each domain of integration on marriage migrants, uh, acceptability of, and uh, sense of belonging to the host society as the out, I mean, identity domain outcomes. And, uh, and uh, using um, the, the qualitative interview data, uh, we also try to describe how the significant integration domain influences on my marriage migrants' acceptability of and sense of belonging to host society. Okay, so uh, basically, I mean, I analyzed the data um, uh, the, I collected uh, uh, for, I mean, the, for my uh, the research project um, on uh, binational families, uh, the social capital and integration in Singapore. So the, the, this study has like a three sets of, you know, the data. Uh, one is quantitative survey uh, with, I mean, the foreign spouses, local spouses, and their children, respectively. And then the, another set of data is, uh, actually consists of in-depth qualitative individual interviews uh, with, you know, foreign spouses, local spouses, and their children, respectively. And uh, the last one uh, is a qualitative family interviews, yeah. Mm. But then the, for this study, I only used one and two. Uh, especially the, the data from the foreign spouses only, yeah. Mm. Uh, eligibility criteria of my study, yeah. Mm. Uh, so we had to, I mean, uh, uh, my research team actually selected, I mean, cross-national families first, yeah, mm, by this criteria, yeah. The family must be formed by international marriage and then the must have, I mean, the family must have at least one child and the uh, to be qualified for uh, as a low income family, they must, uh, you know, uh, receive uh, financial assistance or uh, the monthly, uh, you know, capita in, uh, per, I mean, the per capita monthly per capita income, uh, 1,000. Uh, of course, I mean, there are uh, AG uh, considerations in the eligibility criteria. And then the, these, I mean, the families are recruited, uh, recruited through uh, family service centers and self-help, you know, groups and the relevant social service agencies in Singapore, mostly. Uh, oh, by the way, sorry, I mean, there's a typo here. Uh, I saw, as I told you, I used the survey data and then the interview data, but then the survey data, uh, I only uh, analyze those who are currently married, 
Yeah, because I mean, the, we are looking at uh, their family, I mean, domain integration in particular, right? Uh, so the um, uh, the sample size was, was I mean three hundred and thirty three, and then the interview data we had I mean the, um, uh, the forty seven yeah forty seven interviewees, uh, and then I look through that and then I select some of the uh, uh, the cases I mean I mean the the, the interviews transcripts for uh, to I mean illustrate uh, the quantitative findings yeah the, uh, yeah as a case studies. Okay, so uh, the findings, I mean, the, just give you a ba very basic demographic statistics and then the, uh, some uh, descriptive statistics on the study variables. So you can see, I mean, the, yeah, the gender uh, wise, yeah, the predominantly female, uh, more than 90% of them. Uh, and then you can see, uh, oh, yeah, age is about like a 40. And uh, you can see the quite, you know, uh, good spread of, uh, you know, nationalities of the foreign spouses here. And uh, <clears throat> More than 67% of them are non-Chinese and then the, about like a 30% are Chinese ethnic. And then the educational level is like, you know, uh, the, the majority, I mean, slightly more than half, I mean, like, a, yeah, 60% of them about, you know, secondary or higher education. And then, okay, uh, under the structural domain of integration, I looked at their employment status, okay? So when they are uh, employed and they are in, in structure, I mean, they're integrated structurally, I mean, they would be, and then the housing status too, I mean, the, whether they own or rent, tenant, so visa status even, yeah, when they have like a PR, then yeah, uh, it's more integrated than when they have, you know, uh, yeah, when they don't have, you know, the PR, meaning long-term visit pass and so on and so forth. And then we also look at, I mean, the frequency of encountering, I mean, like a problems in housing, education, medical services, and um, uh, legal services due to visa status or not as a, like a, another like a indicator of structural domain in, uh, integration. And then the social domain integration, we look at social support network size and satisfaction like that. And then the um, uh, family domain integration, we look at couple relationship first, where I mean the satisfaction and, uh, <clears throat> and then parent child, you know, the subsystem. So yeah, the parent child closeness and family functioning and then uh -oh. And then the family functioning. Family functioning at two levels. One is uh, intimacy, like uh, how yeah the cohesive the family is. I mean in terms of the bonding. And then the the another one is I mean the you know the family uh, functioning in terms of like a democratic interactions. And then so it is about more like a, how you know the power is you know evenly distributed among like a. Uh, family members or things and the decision making, how you know the, the democratic the decision making processes and then this etc. And then we also look at the satisfaction with in-law relationship because I mean they had the, uh, the initial, I mean the forefront, like the local contact for the marriage migrants, right? So we look at this one as well. And then the cultural domain, um, it is rather proxy because I mean uh, we used I mean the one scale, but then the it done, I mean the psychometric property of the scale didn't turn out to be very great, so it didn't use for the study. Anyway, so the the duration of you know having lived in Singapore, that's one. I mean, and then the second one is English proficiency. I mean the self-reported, and then the civic and political domain integration. We look at whether they currently participate in a religious group or uh, the, uh, whether they participate in uh, volunteer work and uh, whether they participate in a community organization. So we actually put the, uh, <laughs> the full set of, I mean, like uh, uh, the integration domains, I mean, in this study. Uh, so uh, finally, yeah, identity domain integration, uh, I look at, you know, um, the acceptability of the open society and then the sense of belonging to the hosting society. So uh, the, I just uh, the ran very simple regression analysis, put everything together, uh, so that uh, which you know uh, the domain of integration actually predictive of you know ultimate uh, the integration outcome, which is sense of belonging. Ah, uh, in the people, okay, acceptability of the host society, and then the sense of belonging, right? So for the model for the acceptability of the host society, as you can see, no demographic then variables actually predictable. The outcomes, no, none of the uh, structural domain uh, the indicators actually, yeah, not society. None of them from <clears throat> social domain integration, cultural domain either, civic and political. Sorry, I have to put this in black, but yeah, mm, none of the uh, uh, variables, I mean, on the civic and political domain, but 
Yeah, you see the two of them, I mean, like a parent-child closeness, and then the satisfaction with in-law relationship actually yeah. and mm -hmm. predictable, I mean, the acceptability of the host society. Okay, then how about the sense of belongings, uh, you know, belonging to the, I'm sorry, yeah, the, to the host society. Uh, interestingly, the, uh, among the demographic variables, yeah, the, whether they are Chinese ethnicity or not actually matters. Mm. But then, uh, when you look at the, yeah, uh, you know, the usual, I mean, the those, I mean, the different, uh, the integration domains. Then again, yeah, child, I mean, parent-child closeness, and then the family functioning, uh, democratic interactions, not intimacy, uh, uh, was found to be predictive of, I mean, the sense of belonging to the host society. Yeah, and then the participation in volunteer work. Yeah, uh, actually did make a difference. I mean, in their, you know, the sense of belonging to the host society. Mm. So for like a social researcher like me, this is very exciting findings. I mean, actually. Um, so, uh, but anyway, uh, somewhat unexpected, I would say. So the thing is, I mean, the, then how, yeah, I mean, uh, how can we explain, I mean, like a parent-child relationship is predictive of, I mean, acceptability of the host society or the sense of belonging to the host society, right? I mean, you can actually, yeah, um, uh, make a story out of it, but then the, uh, luckily, I mean, the, we had um, uh, interview data. Hmm. So uh, I focus more on, I mean, I, I uh, intentionally uh, selected, I mean, the, Cases, I mean, the interviewees, uh, we uh, interviewees who are okay, not PR if possible. Okay, this first case, yeah, the, uh, yeah, the PR, but not uh, Chinese. I mean, uh, because I mean, the this is, I mean, uh, the Singapore has, I mean, uh, the, the, the Chinese as a majority of you know, uh, the race group here, uh, and then the uh, the those are not employed and uh, the maybe living in a, I mean, the low income as in like a two-room rental flats or of things because I mean none of the demographic characteristics were found to be predictive right so yeah I try to focus on I mean the the, the, the interviews were uh, more socially I mean uh, financially rather like a deprived yeah uh, but anyway so uh, Madam Kang uh, is a strongly keen to be a good supportive uh, the parents for a child mm. and she uh, I mean the from the the interview uh, transcript we can tell I mean she's close to her child and then the her child also um uh the, the takes in I mean takes initiative to improve herself to develop good study habits and a good characters and etc and so this uh, woman uh, actually uh, has been uh, actively seeking various sources for child I mean the parenting guidance and I mean yeah uh, to uh, so that she can raise a good kid and good citizen so uh when she was asked you know do you feel a uh, sense of belonging mm -hmm. to the Singapore, I mean, to Singapore. And then she immediately said, yes. And then the, she said, okay, why, why, yeah, what makes you actually feel that way? And then the, she said, since my kid is here in Singapore, yeah, I think that I will eventually be settling down here. So the thing is, I mean, she's, you know, uh, after all, she's the, she's a parent of Singaporean child. So this is my responsibility to raise a good child for the country. So that actually, that kind of role, uh, you know, makes her feel, you know, uh, they belong to the uh, society. So probably that's, that, that could be one interpretation we can have. And uh, also the relationship with in-laws, right? And then so uh, the, this woman uh, uh, from Malaysia, but uh, Indonesian ethnic, uh, she is on uh, the long-term visit test class and then uh, living in a, a two-year-old flat, uh, full-time homemaker. Mm -hmm. Maybe she's not employed in the major labor market. And then another woman, uh, yeah, uh, from uh, mainland China, and then the um, long term visit pass, and then, yeah, the two room flat, uh, home makeup, both mentioned that they feel part of the Singaporean society as they found their in laws in particular to be very nice and friendly to them. It's very, I mean, uh, 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 you know, uh, easy to see. So, yeah, you can actually read uh, what they actually uh, shared, yeah. Mm. And then the family functioning. Okay, I, I think, I mean, this one actually deserves closer look. I mean, the, not even the intimacy, right? Yeah. But then the family functioning as in um, the democratic interactions. I mean, how yet yeah, uh, the, the couple uh, interact in the family and then the, how it actually, uh, uh, the, the, how, the demo, how democratic uh, their interactions are uh, as a couple, uh, 
actually um, makes the Korean spouse yeah, uh, feel a sense of belonging. Okay, so number one, uh, we found, I mean, uh, from the transcript, we can see it's uh, the marriage migrant, uh, the Indonesian, uh, I mean, uh, who's from Indonesia, uh, yeah, living like this. And then uh, the, the very open, like a communication pattern. So uh, they, they talk a lot. I mean, like, you know, whatever they see, you know, there's some problems and anything, they just talk it out. Yeah, mm. that's one thing she highlighted about uh, her relationship with her husband. It's not about like a loving thing. I mean, like, <laughs> yeah, how, how romantic their relationship sort of things or how much they love each other sort of things, but more about like communication first, yeah. And then the second, uh, she, I mean, he was around like a 60 and 62, yeah, much older. He was around like a 40 and then she got pregnant and then the, it was very complicated, you know, the pregnancy. But then the you know the her husband actually was very understanding and he and then he managed it all around like a household work and etc. So uh, afterwards you know I mean uh, they just have to you know uh, the count on each other. But then the uh, husband actually helped with uh, uh, some housework. Meaning I mean this is not really very uh, common. I mean in cross national families with low income because I mean the usually uh, uh, you know the, um, there are, I mean the two things are. Uh, um, the, the, not all the local husbands, but then the many local spouses tend to see, I mean, tend to uh, impose very traditional gender roles on their, I mean, the foreign spouses. Yeah, mm, that's one thing. Because, I mean, mainly because they are much, much younger. And then also they are from like a much lower income countries. Mm. So the power imbalance is very pronouncing, I mean, in these families, I mean, for that matter. But then the this husband, I mean, this husband is not like that. Yeah, mm. more like an egalitarian kind of, you know, uh, the behaviors, I mean, the, within the family in terms of like a household matters. Yeah. That's one thing. And then the third one, okay. Um, uh, the family is uh, uh, living with low income. So they need a lot of like, a, I mean, they have a lot of like a financial needs and all. Um, so uh, the thing is, I mean, so, uh, the family, I mean, the couple has to actually seek some help for financial assistance and etc. Uh, but then the uh, the woman uh, that this, I mean, the marriage migrant uh, uh, cannot really speak English, so she has to uh, depend on you know on her husband for like you know finding some help, uh, even like a filling an application form for financial assistance sort of things. But uh, that husband's, I mean, the uh, the primary, I mean, the response, I, I mean, the responsibility. But uh, the husband uh, usually involves her in the process anyway, even if I mean she don't, doesn't understand English, right? Um, and then the so she just tag along with the husband, and then the, when uh, the husband is like uh, seeking some help from the neighbors, and then she also get to you know meet uh, the neighbors of you know the, uh, the in the community, I mean through her uh, the husband, that sort of things, and that happened. So uh, later when she uh, was asked, you know, whether she feels, you know, like she's a part of the community and uh, et cetera, and then she definitely said yes, because yeah, uh, we have the very nice neighbors. I got to know, I, I, I mean, I got to know them. Like, uh, you know, through when we are seeking help, I mean, yeah, my husband was seeking help and then yeah, when I was with him and then I uh, met, uh, meet them sort of things. And then so, so that kind of, you know, the process, you know, you can see, I mean, the, uh, the, how uh, that kind of democratic interactions, I mean, uh, you know, within the couple actually makes a difference for this marriage migrants to uh, uh, feel a sense of, you know, um, belonging to the society. Uh, because, I mean, uh, through her husband, I mean, through her local spouse, spouse uh, she, yeah, she can, I mean, the, she actually develops social networks around her, right? Yeah. So, uh, so that's that's uh, that's about like a family functioning part, and then the volunteering in the community. Of course, I mean the yes, some of the yeah, the respondents actually uh, the, uh, the the say you know uh, I have been involved in like a volunteer work. I mean like just helping out with the community events and etc. And then so when they ask about you know do you feel you know the sense of belonging to the society, then they mention these things. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So. Um, the, yeah, uh, the two theories I mean, you can use, I mean, uh, uh, when you see these findings, uh, okay, one is, I mean, the, uh, when, the, when you see these findings around, I mean, the integration, one is a symbolic interactionism, and then the, another one is social capital theory. Sim 
Modeling interaction is, I mean, very simple thing. Uh, as you know, it's about, you know, the, when you are uh, given a role, then you build, you know, identity, right? Yeah. As I said, I mean, the being a parent of a Singaporean child. And then also, if you uh, if you are given a role, I mean, as a, uh, someone who contributes to the society, I mean, the community, like a, a through volunteering and et cetera. Yeah, that makes, I mean, you know, feel like identity. I mean, that is actually translated into the sense of belonging to the society. Uh, but then the, another thing I just want to highlight is, you know, if you uh, use like a social capital theory to understand, I mean, the, this dynamic, especially the family functioning and then the integration part, uh, it definitely makes sense. I mean, the cross-national families, I mean, um, when uh, the couple is in good relationship, in good terms, and then when they have, you know, good relationship with the children, so things, then it is bonding social capital. But sometimes, I mean, uh, they can't really go beyond that. Yeah, we just love each other, like each other. Yeah, but then it doesn't generate much, you know, other, you know, the, like a bridging capital that actually makes them to access whatever the resources they need to integrate into the host society. But then the, uh, if, I mean, uh, the, the, the families have more like a <laughs> democratic uh, interaction patterns, I mean, the, uh, the, as a part of their functioning, I mean, then, uh, you know, uh, the, um, the bridging capital can be generated, yeah, for them to access uh, the resources out there, I mean, outside the family. So, uh, as I mentioned before, the family functioning uh, at the, is at the two levels. One is family cohesiveness, and then the other one is family adaptability. So, what I highlight here is, I mean, the family adaptability, I mean, as opposed to, you know, family cohesiveness. Uh, it's very important, I mean, for foreign spouses, I mean, the integration into the host society. So the uh, family adaptability is, you know, I mean, the family with a high level of uh, adaptability. That means, I mean, family is flexible in and able to change the power structure and uh, the role relationships and relationship rules of the family, I mean, the marital or the entire family system in response to situational or the developmental stress. <laughs> So that's, I, I think, I mean, this is what was illustrated by the case I just, you know, shared with you before. So, um, um, the, so this type of family functioning actually opens up the larger social context uh, of the host of the society for foreign spouses and their ability to develop bridging social capital. So, um, sorry, yeah, so uh, the implication of these findings for uh, social interventions Okay, one. I think, uh, I think we should wrap up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm almost done. Yeah, uh, just to, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So I, I think I mean the social program. Uh, I mean the if if we provide I mean the social program that aim to enhance I mean the role competency of social I mean the foreign spouses as members of the family and the community that would be definitely helpful. But then. Uh, when you have to work with the, you know, the family, okay, then the, it's better to focus on the uh, family's adaptability rather than micro level relationship matters or the provision of like itemized social support, like information or the, and, uh, those sort of things. Yeah. So I would like to highlight, you know, high flexibility and adaptability of the family system would facilitate the building and uh, building of bridging social capital for, um, you know, foreign spouses and the family. <laughs> but I, mean, I just want to highlight, okay, these three points, okay, uh, because I mean, you may think it's rather unexpected. I mean, the, none of the other, you know, <laughs> the, uh, integration domain variables found to be significant. Uh, that means, I mean, there could be some moderating effects of some of the, uh, some of the other, you know, integration domains for the association between these two. Maybe um, the, the, uh, the, uh, the families with, I mean, the, I mean, the foreign spouses with low family functioning, um, you know, in that case, maybe the, uh, who knows, I mean, the PR help, yeah, um, in the, in, I mean, the sense of belonging. Or um, we also have to look at some structural relationship among different integration domains, and yeah. So meaning maybe it's not just a two levels, maybe, I mean, a two stage, but maybe it could be three stages, right? Like a structural domain to like a family domain and a family domain to the outcome, something like that. So yeah, that's about it. Sorry, I went over time, <laughs> okay. Yes, I think you also have to do this interesting talk. And so I actually have one question about the integration. And so integration, uh, in a way, should be a two-way street, right? And so to what extent are you still belonging to the whole society? 
uh, on the one hand, it's about to what extent you feel accepted. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, of course, it's about your acceptability of the whole society. Mm -hmm. And it's, I see that uh, you have a uh, show results uh, in both directions. Mm -hmm. But uh, regarding this uh, cultural acceptance, uh, it seems that now it's mainly about to what extent this uh, like immigrant, uh, this uh, uh, foreign bride uh, try to assimilate and uh, like uh, uh, like blend in mm -hmm. Singapore, but on the other hand, to what extent that uh, her culture um, is also uh, embraced or like understood uh, by her uh, children, by her family, and even by the society in general, uh, that might be like the other side of the story. So for example, whether or not uh, um, like her language uh, is used inside the family where uh, like being learned by by the children, like bilingualism mm -hmm. of the children, and to what extent that, for example, a husband will learn about her culture, her uh, heritage, mm -hmm. and so I think uh, this um, the uh, the other side, the opposite side of the story, mm -hmm. might also be helpful to um, make her feel that actually a uh, like entire package of identity mm -hmm. uh, has been uh, like built in mm -hmm. this current functioning of family and uh, like daily lives. And I'm wondering like uh, whether or not you have uh, stories uh, in, in that part. Of oh, you, you mean the uh, cultural adaptations? The cultural um, acceptance of oh, cultural the, acceptance, yeah, acceptance of, the, yeah. of, uh, of her, of her, of her native heritage. Oh, okay. Yeah. Her own, I mean, the, you mean the here, I mean the local spouses acceptance of yeah, our children, right? Okay, yeah. the so children. Okay. And I think yeah, that many yeah, of yeah, the yeah. variables and yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. are about whether or not uh, mm -hmm. she tried to make her children like well uh -huh. assimilate and integrate into Singaporean society, but to the extent that uh, she is also allowed and encouraged to right. yeah, 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 right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, yeah, the two ways, of course, are but then the uh, I think I mean very much I mean the great variations I mean the uh, you know the among the uh, the different interviews, uh, but then the typically I mean the the these I mean the families um, okay the, the foreign spouses that they they actually sometimes bring their children to their home country when they visit their own I mean their country that uh, quite often, uh, not quite often because they are low income but anyway uh, when they go then they they bring their children along right and then the what I found is I mean the children they like it. Yeah, that's one way. But then the uh, uh, the um, what is it? I mean, how she? I mean, the, how foreign spouses actually uh, the maintain her own cultural heritage, like a, for example, like a food or language at home. Well, I see a lot of like a variations. Yeah, uh, I can't really uh, pinpoint like a general pattern around it. So some 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 uh, like a local families. I mean, yeah, I mean the local the local in laws, for example. They are very accepting. I mean, the you know these foreign brides. I mean, like offering of their own like a food. Or, yeah, they they really welcome. I mean, they kind of like you know exposure. But then the some some families are totally opposite. Yeah, totally opposite. So I, I don't uh, exactly know. I mean, it depends on uh, which one you look at. Uh, I eventually I have to. I mean, the look at all you know qualitative interviews and then what is the more like a general patterns. I mean, uh, emerging from it. But at this stage, I can't really uh, yeah give you. More like a, you know, uh, more generalizable kind of patterns. I mean, yet, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but definitely two ways. But then the yeah, when they uh, when uh, yeah. So much. Any other questions? I think it's quite late, so maybe we okay. can uh, bring the conversation. Uh, a bit yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I would love to do that. <laughs> if you're gonna close. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, Zoom. 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 Uh, was developed based on the assumption aligned with the particular situation. Actually, the original framework is not particularly for marriage migrant. I mean, the migrants in general. But then the the uh, Spencer and Charles uh, Chartley actually um uh, they use uh, the migrant marriage migrants as a 
this example to explain the the, uh, the framework. And then another thing is, I mean, uh, in my adaptation, I didn't really, you know, like uh, add or, uh, you know, the, remove any of the um, the, cult, uh, the integration domains from uh, domains of, you know, uh, transcend charts list. Actually, I use them all, but then the uh, the charts list, uh, I mean, the Spencer and charts list, just, I mean, uh, very much, to me, it's quite abstract. I mean, it's not really like an empirical model itself. So I just try to build up, you know, the empirical model, I mean, which is, uh, you know, the testable rather than uh, the conceptual. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the difference. I and mean, so I, I don't really think, I mean, it's a really like a, uh, adaptation. I mean, by adaptation, I missed some of, I mean, or omit uh, some of the important uh, integration domains. But it's just that I could have, uh, I mean, of course, I mean, they're low income. And so I uh, it was expected that, I mean, I mean, kind of like we can expect, you know, maybe the visa status, right? Uh, or the employment status, maybe. They may have, I mean, the most significant, I mean, the significant impact on, I mean, the sense of belonging. But then uh, actually, <laughs> data doesn't show. So that's why I'm saying, you know, maybe there could be moderation, yeah, I mean, of certain other variables, I mean, uh, for the relationship between the family and then the integration outcomes, yeah. Uh, so it, this is subject to further investigation. Um, for now, it's a you know, preliminary <laughs> these things, yes. I hope you understand that. Mm. Mm -hmm. No? Yeah. Okay. All right. Over to you. Okay. <laughs> Please allow me to give a very short uh, wrap up. Okay. Uh, we are approaching the time. Uh, first of all, uh, Singapore Research Nexus is uh, really a major platform of FAS uh, for us to uh, distribute, uh, distribute our findings. Uh, you know, uh, particularly we hope like this platform could help us uh, to uh, promote cooperation within FASS and also beyond FASS. Uh, so thank you very much for all the audience today to join us. We expect you to join us more in the future. <laughs> and more importantly, thank you so much for the four significant speakers today. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentations and also each and for your moderating. Yeah. Uh, I just want to uh, very briefly summarize today's journey. Uh, we have a four wonderful presentations at the very beginning. I think Yen Yi uh, mentioned a very interesting topic. Uh, that is how about the new technology will bring in new uh, social inequalities. I think that's a very interesting story. Particularly, uh, it's why very eye-opening because we usually think like for disability, uh, in the literature of disability, people think like either it's because of a biomedical limitation or because the socially created barrier. But for his case, it was actually the effort to remove those barriers, create a new risk for disabilities. And, and that's very nuanced findings. And then I think it's very puzzling, waiting for new uh, answers. We still don't have a clear answer about it. So the new technology and social inequality. With regard to that, actually, Sun Hu's talk, uh, highlight another development of technology, that is the teleworking. And uh, Sirhu's perspective is very unique. That is from the employer's perspective, to see what kind of stereotype or stigma existing uh, in this labor market, running against those new type of teleworking. And particularly Sirhu highlight the old fashioned stereotype like gender, parenthood, how it actually translate under this new framework and very interesting uh, findings. And also uh, for my personal point of view, I'm still think like whether it's the stigma or not, we don't know, but this is really a field that is, which is very interesting. And then it's, we have to solve it in the current labor market. With, with regard to current labor market, actually the most important inequality, long studied is gender inequality. And then Jessica actually, help us to re review the old literature and then show us actually the very uh, cutting edge research result. We, we all learn a lot. I want to say uh, with regard to this, uh, uh, this work, I, I have a lot of questions to discuss. <laughs> but I think it's, uh, uh, gender is so important, particularly we're now having a time full of AI and technology. Mm -hmm. Our future work will be very different. How that will change the gender uh, labor division. I think there's more research. We expect Jessica could uh, you know, show up in the new future. And 
Jessica's talk actually focused on one important mechanism with children. And that actually highly related to family. And our uh, last uh, speaker, uh, Angela, actually focused on the family, but not only family, the immigration family with low income. To see how within the family, social inequality manifested itself. We, we see the, the, the result is very interesting, actually. In order to get integrated with society, you have to have a good family first. And then it looks like you really have to maintain a good family relationship then you can have the bridging social capital to the broader social network. So uh, this is a very short summary, but I think more work of making us to do to share with all of you. Uh, again, thank you so much to join us. <laughs>